Buckle in, sports fans. You're listening to The William Haynes Show. The program will be starting in just a couple of minutes, so grab your popcorn and get ready to enjoy the show. While you're waiting, make sure you're following us on social media at WHBC Stream and staying tuned to WHBCStream.com. We're so glad to have you today on the program and we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line on Twitter or call the show 352-639-0036. And thanks again for tuning in. HBC HBC. Well, it looks like we had a bit of issue there. I forgot to unmute the mic on the intro, but it is William Haynes here. You there at 9.03 with 23 seconds to go along with it here on this Wednesday night, the eve of MLB opening day. Of course, tomorrow starting at 7 is Yankees and Nationals at 7 o'clock. Max Scherzer v. Garrett Cole. That one is sure to be a dandy. And then later that night, we have the Giants and Dodgers taken on of course a rivalry not probably going to be a competitive game but just so glad to have a regular season baseball back in our lives it's been a while opening day this year was supposed to be on march 26 as all of you know probably about 104 105 games would have been played by the time the season finally gets underway and we do have a bit more of a juicy monologue spent some pre-pro time writing that so without further ado Wouldn't you know, the MLB season is finally here. When spring training came to a halt in mid-March, the path to return was unclear. The players themselves even had no idea what to do or when they could get back to playing the game that they loved. But in the middle of all that love stood financial concerns. Major leaguers wondered if the offered salaries for Major League Baseball would be enough to offset injury concerns, let alone concerns of contracting the virus that sent everyone home to begin with. 25 became 50, 50 became 75, and eventually full 100% prorated salaries were offered for Major League Baseball to get this season going. And so, when everyone finally agreed on a compromise, this marathon of a 60-game season was to follow a highly expedited summer training. Three weeks was about half the time as the five to six weeks in spring training, and soon joining discussions about how to set up a lineup make a starting rotation, and manage a bullpen were talks of cardboard cutout fans, 
fake crowd noise, daily COVID-19 tests, and concerns of health for those close to ball players across the league. The face of the league, Mike Trout, the outfielder of the Los Angeles Angels, had expressed concerns for his child that is due August 4th before today announcing that he was all in this season after giving a vote of confidence in baseball's health and safety protocols. On the other side of this unfortunate coin, former MLB superstar and World Series champion Buster Posey, the catcher of the San Francisco Giants, opted out of the season over concerns for the prematurely born twins him and his wife were soon to adopt. Needless to say, as we sit here on the eve of opening day, this 2020 Major League Baseball season is not what we expected it to be. And while it is easy to forget the downside, let's not forget about the positives. When was the last time that all 30 MLB teams were tied for first place on July 23rd? Even teams that are clearly rebuilding this season will have a chance to throw a complete haymaker into everything that we know about the sport of baseball. Speaking locally, the Rays will have another chance to prove themselves as real innovators and change the sport for good. This long-winded monologue is really to say, in a time where the world is far from perfect, let's not expect sports to be. You know as well as I do that sports can make the world just a little bit better place to live, something we truly need right now. As we said, tomorrow, kicking off this MLB season for good, it's such a joy that we've been able to get underway. There's been concerns that this would get stalled before it even got up and running, but as we said, 7 p.m. tomorrow on ESPN and pretty much anywhere else, I'm sure you can get Yankees and Nationals and Dr. Anthony Fauci throwing out the first pitch. Garrett Cole going for the Yankees. Max Scherzer going for the Nationals. That's certainly going to be a good game. And then the nightcap with the Dodgers and Giants before all other teams will have their opening day on Friday. So we'll get you, we'll probably give you predictions on all the odds on that game as well as go through the Rays uh, season and break down where I think all the divisions will line up as we go through here. Uh, the last couple nights we've gone just just about one hour programs nine to ten but as starters are going here in the summer camp i'm trying to get stretched out two hour program here tonight nine to eleven on the east coast and as we get into the news the main news line today i would say mookie betts the outfielder for the los angeles dodgers has signed an extension for 13 years 392 million dollars this uh, tops the deal that mike trout received just a few months ago, 13 months, 360 was the deal that he had. Uh, for bets, this includes a $65 million signing, $65 million signing bonus. So he's going to be a lot richer uh, than he was yesterday. And he will still make the schedule $27 million uh, that he was already on contract for in 2020, or basically the prorated equivalent of that $27 million. The timeline for bets, uh, he came through the minors as a low rated uh, major league pr- uh, prospect. He was seen as nothing more than a bench asset, a guy that who could pinch run, um, late game defensive replacement, not really looked on to be the kind of player that he is now. Of course, we know in 2018, he won the American League MVP over a guy like Mike Trout and helped his Boston Red Sox to a World Series title over the Los Angeles Dodgers. And of course, in 2019, had a pretty good season, but could not push his Red Sox into the postseason as they had a bit of a World Series hangover. And in the offseason, uh, the Red Sox, um, after the um, basically the MLB report coming out that they'd used Apple Watches uh, to steal signs in 2018, basically using Apple Watches, and I, it was a whole convoluted thing, but to, to steal signs just like the Astros uh, were doing, the Red Sox fired their general manager, uh, Dave Dombrowski, as well as their, their manager, Alex Cora, and they did bring in, the reason for saying all this, their new general manager was a guy who had worked with Eric Neander, the GM of the Rays, Chain Bloom. So they bring him in, and what does Chain Bloom do as one of his first moves but ship off the two most highly paid superstars? Uh, he ships Mookie Betts and David Price to the Los Angeles Dodgers in exchange for Alex Verdugo, a major league player who hit about 12 home runs, about 300 uh, in about 120 so games. And, and also prospect Jeter Downs. It was a three-team deal that involved the Twins. The Dodgers ended up giving those two, uh, Verdugo and Downs, as well as Kenta Maeda, who made his way over uh, to the Minnesota Twins. But relatively speaking, that is not a lot to give up uh, for a former Cy Young winner in David Price and former American League MVP 
uh, in Mookie Betts. Now, David Price did opt out of this season. He's probably the most significant figure, uh, depending on how you feel about Buster Posey. Those two probably just about even as far as MLB stardom. But David Price opted out for this season, so that hurts the Dodgers a little bit, As though, although they still have one of the best uh, starting rotations in the National League. Uh, but Mookie Betts, he had one year left on his contract, as we said, was scheduled to make $27 uh, million dollars in this 2020 season. And it was unsure, as he was on his one-year deal, whether or not he would resign, resign with the Dodgers after this season. He would be free as a free agent. He was done with all of his years um, of arbitration. So it was unsure if the Dodgers were even going to be able to keep bets, which I guess kept his value a little bit down. And part of the reason why Boston wanted to move on when they did, Shane Bloom, of course, coming from a Rays organization where when players like Mookie Betts come of age, as he, I believe, will have his 29-year-old season this year, when players get to that point where they've reached their peak and they're ready for a big deal, that's when a guy you know like Shane Bloom watch Eric Neander ship players off like, you know, Evan Longoria, David Price, all those years ago. We've seen it time and time again. So Chain Bloom taking the, the Boston Red Sox, who are one of the wealthier franchises in MLB. Of course, we saw only a couple of years ago that they were, you know, dealing away players and trying to get contracts restructured in order to get under the luxury tax. Um, this baseball, of course, is sport without a salary cap, but that luxury tax, no team has really been bold enough to try and go over that as you uh, get fined millions of dollars as well as draft picks and all things like that. So it does just about as good job um, as a salary cap. But of course, without real salary uh, revenue sharing, there's teams like the Red Sox and the Yankees that have more money uh, than the other teams. But basically, the Red Sox said it catching a lot of heat as one of the wealthier teams in baseball. They could have signed Mookie Betts to this deal. Of course, this is the richest contract I believe in Major League Baseball history, or maybe um, I think Garrett Cole got just about as much as well, but more than Mike Trout, who previously was the most uh, for a position player. And I think what is a bit interesting, I think if you ask anyone, they would say Mike Trout is the best player in Major League Baseball, the, 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 the face of the league, and the fact that Mookie Betts got just about $30 million more over the same amount of years. I think that just shows you that's the price of admissions. That's really where uh, these contracts are headed to. Whether the player is good as good or not, uh, it's next man up, and ne- the, each player is going to get more money than the last. We see this in the NFL with the quarterback contracts. Of course, before um, Patrick Mahomes signed that ridiculous $400 million plus dollar deal, I believe it was, $450 million, I think, in total, uh, you were seeing guys like... Uh, Matt Ryan and guys like that getting paid more than Aaron Rodgers um, and Dak Prescott asking for 30 plus million dollars a year more than he's worth of course Matt um, Dak Prescott excuse me is not no nowhere near as good as a guy like Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers or you know Patrick Mahomes but he wants to be up there simply just because he's the next man up and that's that's pretty much what's become a sports contracts um, so the Dodgers were willing to pay that price of admission. We know they are one of the more wealthy franchises in MLB, and they they were willing to pony up and lock bets down long term. So that's really the main sports story today. Is bets stays in Los Angeles? <laughs> it's the the Dodgers were thinking they were going to need this whole season to convince him, but before a regular season game was played, uh, bets is committed to staying in Dodgers blue. I'll read something that Alden Gonzalez, a staff writer for ESPN put out just about an hour ago. Mookie Betts used rings, plural, when talking about his hopes for his Dodgers career. He called them a well-oiled machine and said the talent throughout this organization convinced him to forgo his free agency. Asked if the uncertain market also played a role, Betts said, the market wasn't what I was worried about, just fair value. That's been my number one thing for my whole career is the value and that's it. Once I got to that point and being somewhere I love being, the match was perfect. I, I think... That's easy for Mookie Betts to say, of course, saying, you know, money wasn't a concern when you get paid more than Mike Trout. Uh, I think it certainly worked out for him to get that much money and play for a contender. He'd be able to add on to his legacy, undoubtedly. Obviously, the Dodgers, a team that he believes in and can win some more championships. He's already got 
a World Series ring and an American League MVP award to his name. As we mentioned, and as we move further down of the news items, we got just a couple more uh, MLB league wide. But the Mets starting pitcher Marcus Stroman tore his calf. I don't know if that's today or the Mets waited uh, to announce that and put him on the injured list uh, today. Marcus Stroman, a guy who the Mets traded for at the trade deadline of last season, he was the ace of the Toronto Blue Jays, of course, a Long Island native. He grew up just about 30 miles from City Field, the stadium where the Mets play. He was very excited to play for the New York Mets, and he had a 4-2 and two record uh, with a sub, I want to say sub-3, maybe even a sub-2 uh, ERA. He pitched really well down the stretch in the 2019 season as the Mets tried to make that playoff push, push that came just short. Uh, but he was the guy that was supposed to help their rotation down the road. Now, Noah Syndergaard, who was originally their number two starter behind two-time Cy Young Award winner Jacob deGrom. Noah Syndergaard uh, tours UCL and has undergone Tommy John surgery. Now, Marcus Stroman with a calf tear will at least miss part of this 2020 season. Manager Luis Rojas was unwilling to say how much time he expects Stroman to miss. Uh, but he says no surgeries required and... I'm no doctor, obviously. I don't know, you know, exactly how you know calf tears and calf surgeries would work, but I believe maybe they're just trying to see how it will heal. Just because he's not getting surgery now certainly does not mean he will need it uh, in the future. In a 60-game season like this, I think that's the right move um, to just kind of see where it's at. But just because he doesn't need surgery, I would say to Mets fans, don't just assume that he'll be, he will be back. Uh, he can miss some significant time, and of course, in a 60-game season, that's really only two months. By the time he can get that calf healed up and by the time he can get stretched back out to be ready to make a real major league start, I think the season could possibly be pretty much all, almost over. Um, I know that's a little bit doom and gloom, but I think that's really uh, the reality of the situation. And now this puts the Mets in a big uh, hole compared to where they were yesterday. Of course, they, they have not looked good in their exhibition games. They got beat up on by the New York Yankees. I don't think that means a whole lot. But I think this is the real negative news to come out of, um, from the Mets. Now they're missing their number two and number three starters. So, of course, you have Jacob DeGrom, who <laughs> about a week ago was thought would not be able to go for opening day with um, a back. I don't know if it was a back strain or back discomfort or what. Back stiffness, I think, was the word that they used. So Jacob DeGrom, we don't know how many innings he'll be able to pitch out of the gate, but he's the opening day starter. And after that, it's unclear. You have a guy like Stephen Matz who pitched okay at times last year, and then the two guys they brought in in the offseason, Rick Porcella, who won uh, the American Cy Young Award uh, for the Boston Red Sox. He's certainly not the player he was then. Uh, we saw him pitch okay in one of those exhibition games against the Yankees, but certainly did not look his best. He looked like he did for the Red Sox last year with a losing record and a, I believe it was like a five. It was either a four or five, uh, just about ERA. And then Michael Walker, who I believe was in a, an NLCS MVP about seven or eight years ago for whatever team that he played for. So two guys that are past their prime most likely, but do have those um, awards to their name. So that will get you to four. I have no idea past that because the guys like Michael Walker, they weren't even sure if they were going to need him, need to use him as a starter. So now you probably slot him in as your number four. I have no idea who their fifth starter is. The Mets, not a team that I believe has really messed with the bullpen or messed with the opener or a bullpen day, I should say. Uh, they may have to seriously look at that now. I'm not sure uh, where they look in starting pitching as far as our minor league system is concerned. Of course, minor league Baseball not played this year, but basically in one of your minor league facilities, uh, you can keep a camp going of some of your minor league prospects in case you need to call them up, uh, whether a guy goes on the injured list or the COVID-19 designated injury list. So the Mets have players that are you know still game ready in their minor league training facility. So whether they bring a guy up there or they decide maybe move someone out of the bullpen, I believe Seth Lugo was a guy uh, that started at the beginning of his Mets career as we approach the first 2020 uh, sports break of the show. So Marcus Stroman is out for at least the start of the season. Mookie Betts signing that big deal. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Do not touch that dial. HBC. Really, besides the news that we've talked about, the only sports going on right now are the MLB exhibition games. Of course, opening day 
will be tomorrow, but the exhibition games that have gone final, the Reds 2-1 over the Tigers, the Indians 5-3 over the Pirates, Cardinals 6-3 over the Royals, Marlins 6-2 over the Braves, some games currently in action in the fifth inning against the Brewers 2-1 over the White Sox, also in the fifth, Rockies 2, Rangers nothing. Uh, a Blue Jays and Red Sox game got postponed about halfway through, and in the sixth inning it is the Cubs up 4-2 to two over the Minnesota Twins. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Hey, sports fans. William's currently in the can, but he'll be right back. We're currently on a commercial break, so don't touch that dial. Remember, you can call us at 352-639-0036 or drop us a line on Twitter at WHBC Stream to tell us what's on your mind. We want to talk sports. We want to get unruly. We want you to tell us what you think so we can argue. Anyway, when all that's said and done, please stay tuned for William's World Famous Around the XFL podcast and other projects that he's currently got in the works. Please visit whbcstream.com and thanks again for listening in. HBC and we're back on the William Haynes show at about 9 24 here on this Wednesday night MLB opening day eve you can call the show at 352-639-0036 or drop us a line at WHBC stream um, if you're listening to us on Spreaker.com, you can leave a message in the chat as well and we'll read your thoughts on the air um, talking some more Mets I just wanted to talk a little bit more about their starting rotation now that Marcus Stroman is going to be missing some time. Uh, Anthony DiComo, uh, who covers the Mets, the uh, the rotation for the first three games on Friday, it'll be Jacob DeGrom. Saturday, Steven Matz. Sunday, Rick Porcello. 
with presumably uh, Michael Walker after that. And the only talks that I've seen, uh, which is the one that I mentioned, moving Seth Lugo out of the bullpen and into the starting rotation at the five spot. Now, Seth Lugo has certainly not been as good uh, as a starter as he has as a reliever. That's why the Mets moved him to the bullpen in the first place. And at a time in the 2019 season where they could not have a back-end reliever uh, to get saves for their life, of course, Edwin Diaz, uh, the guy that they picked up in that, really what has turned out to be a bad trade uh, from the Mariners, he f- he fell apart. Um, Dylan Potensis, uh missed some time with injuries. Or Robert Giselman, I should say. Dylan Potensis is the guy that they picked up um, from the Yankees. Uh, but Seth Lugo is really the only guy out of the bullpen that was dependable. And so that's a tough pill to swallow if you move him up into the starting rotation, especially a spot where he's not going to be making as much of an impact. But I don't think they have much of a choice. I have not seen a word uh, about a guy in their minor league system that they're confident about bringing up and being in the starting rotation the first time through. Now, if we were talking about a calf uh, pull or a calf strain for Stroman, it would be different. You know, maybe you miss a couple weeks and then he gets built back up and you slot him right back in. This is a calf tear. So to me, I would say most likely, I mean, we'll probably get updates as we go along. Either Marcus Stroman decides to play through this somehow um, or he's just not going to play and the Mets are going to have to figure out this rotation on the fly. If anyone else gets injured like a Rick Porcello or a Michael Walker, I don't know exactly what they're going to do. And whether uh, this now with the rotation the way that it is and you only have um, three legit starters, I would say. Uh, Steven Matz is a guy that was pretty good for them last year. The bullpen, which was already going to decide this Mets season, is now putting a lot more pressure on them. It helps that they picked up some arms. Um, they've got. I like their bullpen top to bottom. I think they have guys that can get guys out. And it helps that their offense is going to be really good this year, especially with the new addition of the designated hitter um, in the National League. That, that'll give them a guy... Give them... Uh, an opportunity to give guys like Yuan Cespedes uh, time hitting while he has not looked good in exhibition games that we've seen. We know he's going to start uh, a designated hitter uh, on opening day. Not sure what their lineup is going to look like, but top to bottom, it is a really good lineup. They've got guys uh, like Conforto and McNeil and Nimmo who can hit well for contact. And of course, uh, Cano is a good hitter as well. Uh, he's been hitting at the top of the lineup at the three spot in exhibition games. And, of course, Pete Alonzo, who's the home run king. And you have Yohannes Cespedes somewhere. I'm not sure if they're going to put him at cleanup. I would imagine not unless he starts heating up. He didn't hit any home runs that we've seen in exhibition games and just a lot of ground outs. Um, And they're probably going to keep him at that DH spot to keep him healthy. Of course, he hasn't played a major league game in just about two years. So it might take him a while to get readjusted. Uh, But I think if that offense can put up a lot of runs in that bullpen, Puts up a superhuman performance. They may have a chance, but that starting rotation from this point out is going to have to stay completely healthy. And for a third straight season, they are going to need a superhuman performance out of Jacob DeGrom, of course, coming off the back-to-back National League Cy Young Award seasons. An ERA under two. Uh, It's amazing that he had a losing record, I think, in one of those seasons. That's how bad his run support has been. Uh, So that just goes to show if they can put up some runs, they might be able to do some damage. Uh, but it is going to be a really competitive National League East, and they're going to have to play uh, an American League East, which uh, is top-heavy, but I don't think it's good top to bottom. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later in the show. Again, trying to go 9-11 to 11 here tonight, getting stretched back out for a two-hour program, uh, doing some more news, and then we'll talk uh, all MLB. I'll give you my previews. We've got the over-under on win total, so we'll talk about all that, maybe some award winners. Uh, potentially and give some more race talk now as we segue over to the next uh, and the third and final news item here no Pittsburgh for Blue Jays now if you guys have not been caught up on this the Blue Jays and I think I talked about this on light, last night's show as well uh, but the Blue Jays were anticipating on playing their home games in Rogers Center which is their their stadium in Toronto uh, they've been they've been doing their summer camp there. It appeared as everything was good. They had gotten the okay from the city of Toronto as well as I forget the province that Toronto is in. They had gotten the clear, and they all go from those levels of government. But recently, uh, during this week, the Canadian federal government has come out and say that they do are not going to allow uh, the Blue Jays to travel 
uh, and play those games at Rogers Center. The reason, because the U.S. has been a worldwide hotspot for COVID-19, uh, they've not the but not to I'm not going to get opinionated about this. The numbers have been fairly high in the United States and the Canadian government, who I believe their numbers have been a bit lower. Uh, they do not want to have teams that have been traveling all over the United States and all the biggest cities uh, come into that stadium and be staying in the hotel and the that community. So no Toronto, no Rogers Center for the Blue Jays. Now, the other options that had initially come out, they have AAA facility in Buffalo, which also helps because it's relatively close to Toronto. Um, and also their spring training and minor league facility in Dunedin. Uh, that was originally going to be the plan, and then concerns came out from players uh, that those facilities were not up to snuff for them. Of course, the clubhouse and all those type of facilities are not at a major league level. Uh, of course, you know, my, you know, with the minor leagues, they don't have as much money put in. And also, I believe, some concerns with the broadcasting, where they were going to have the cameras, I don't know if there's a whole lot of validity to that. I mean, they broadcast spring training games uh, from there. Maybe it's a little bit different. And also the lighting was a concern, which I, I don't honestly get that either. If it's if it, if the lights can play minor league baseball, I don't understand why they can't play major league baseball. But those were the concerns, and that uh, had pushed the Toronto Blue Jays or the whatever Blue Jays, as I'm sure they'll be known uh, this year, to look at alternative options. And something that we thought would be the plan um, – for them moving forward was for them to play in Pittsburgh in PNC Park where the Pirates play their games. I don't know. I, someone maybe looked at the schedules and figured this out, but uh, outside of one game, I believe on, it was like July the 29th, the Blue Jays and Pirates did not have a scheduled home game until uh, late September. So it worked out where they could have done it. Um, basically that's that stadium would have had to be game ready basically every day for a couple months, but that's not a big deal. Um, and they're waiting for the all clear and the Pennsylvania board of health and safety or whatever. Um, they came out and said, no, we don't want the blue Jays playing here. I don't, I'm not sure to why they would say that if they're going to let the pirates play, I don't understand why not the blue Jays. Maybe they just want to limit as much exposure, as much exposure as they can and just keep outsiders out. Um, we know, from Pennsylvania, they have said that they will not allow fans at stadiums in 2020. That goes for both the Philadelphia Phillies and the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, which is sets a little bit of pres- precedent and is um, definitely relevant in that regard. So no fans for the Eagles this year. So it makes sense. That's where the, the Pennsylvania government decided to go, but it is unfortunate for the Blue Jays. And now they're looking back. Either they're, they're going to have to bite, their, bite the bullet and go back on, I guess, their commitment to look outside of those minor league facilities, whether they're going to be in Buffalo or Dunedin, or I guess worst case scenario for them is 60 game road trip. Every game you're scheduled to have at home, you play in that home stadium. And I'm sure they would make adjustments like they would change the scoreboard and, you know, the the crowd noise would be more advantageous and the Blue Jays would bat in the bottom of the inning. Uh, But I, I think, I mean, you were already losing the home field advantage of, you know, having a home base, uh, having your training facility there, you know, sleeping in your own bed uh, during home stands, they were already going to be without that. Um, but I think that's just kind of a just a cherry on top of really what is a crap Sunday uh, for the Toronto Blue Jays if they're going to have to play all sixty games on the road. At that point, call them the Road Warrior Blue Jays. I mean, that's really what they're going to have to be. Um, another another point I would make um, about the players not wanting to. Uh, play in the minor league facilities, whether it's in Buffalo or in Dunedin. Um, I know there are some veterans on this team, of course, as there are on every team, but the Blue Jays being such a young team, they're led by those prospects, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., uh, Bo Bichette, Kavon Biggio, all guys that you know are top prospects. They came up last year. They, they looked pretty good. Those are guys that not too long ago, a year, a year and a half, two years ago, were playing in those same minor league facilities and all of a sudden they're at the big league level. I don't know if it's them that are saying it, but I know the Blue Jays on average are one of the youngest teams in Major League Baseball. So that is a bit surprising, but I would say if they're going to have to do it, if anyone can adjust, it would be them. You know, a bunch of young guys that are just happy to be playing Major League Baseball, you would assume. So they would probably be able to cope uh, with that. Um, it looks like Buffalo is the front runner 
uh, as they are a triple A. I don't know if there's a whole lot of difference. I haven't, you know, been to a ton of minor league stadiums. I don't know if there's a difference from single A to double A to triple A stadiums. I would imagine they're all just about the same. I believe they all draw about the same amount of fans. So the lighting and I, I would assume would be the same. Um, <clears throat> I think the Toronto, the Dunedin Blue Jays are, I want to say a single A or, or Ricky A ball. Um, but it is their spring training facility. So you think they'd put a little bit more into that. I know they've been doing some renovations on it, but two things I would say one for sure. And another point I'll make that no one else is probably talking about that might be a dark horse as to why the blue Jays are trying to stay out of Dunedin. The, f- the first one is which obviously the United States has had their problems with COVID-19, but the state of Florida, especially, I mean, if you're listening to this show, you're probably somewhere in the Pinellas County in this Tampa Bay area. I know I live about 20 minutes from the stadium where they play. Um, I don't know about this area specifically, but I know this part of the state in central Florida uh, has had some some issues with positive testing and all that. You know, Florida has not done great compared to other states as far as COVID cases. So that's something that the Blue Jays are trying to look off of. And then another thing I would say, um, Reese McGuire, a guy... I don't know if he's going to be on their opening day 30 man, but I, they announced he's going to be on their 60 man. Their catcher, Reese McGuire, uh, during spring training, I think it was in February, um, of course, their stadium in Dunedin. I'm not sure how far away, but there's a Dollar General in Dunedin where he was seen in his car doing something that he should not have been doing. And someone called the police and he was charged uh, with public exposure. Um, and I believe he was acquitted or whatever, uh, found guilty. I'm not exactly sure what the result of the case was in the court of Pinellas County. So I don't know how much of a concern that really is. I think they already do not want to play in Dunedin because of the COVID case in Florida. And I think that issue with Reese McGuire, since they decided to have him um, on the roster, I think that's an added bonus uh, well, I, I guess that's a, not a great phrase, but just another reason why they do not want to play in Dunedin. Uh, so a little bit of an insider tip. If they have odds on this, I would definitely be putting money on Buffalo um, as to where they're going to play and potentially if that is side or they're forced into having to do that 60-game road trip if Major League Baseball is not going to give them the all-clear on playing in a minor league facility. Um, the Washington Nationals, I know last week this was a story – as we're a couple minutes in uh, to another uh, 2020 sports break, um, the Washington Nationals they had not originally gotten the all clear uh, from the D.C. authorities. Um, I don't know how much different, but of course it's not a state government; it's more of a local. Um, but of course, you know, with D.C. having all the federal government there, you would want to keep the code cases down, obviously. And Nationals Park, I believe, is in the borders of the District of Columbia. So that's the government that, you know, kind of bodies over that. They had not given them the all clear to even play, let alone without fans. They said that they could not play in Nationals Park regardless. So they were having to look at either playing in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where one of their minor league stadiums are, or in their spring training in another minor league facility in Palm Springs, Florida. And, of course, the Palm, you know, playing in Florida was not – a great thing for them and the dc officials ended up giving them an exemption um so i don't know if that's something that had gone into it if major league baseball stepped in and maybe gave a little bit of encouragement saying you know look they're not going to play um in a minor league facility we can't clear that so you know you know please kind of figure this out i don't know if that was what it went into it but uh, the nationals did end up getting that exemption uh, but the blue jays are really between a rock and a hard place here it, it helps that there's no fans, I would say, if they're going to have to be on the road. Because, that, I mean, that talk about a disadvantage. Imagine playing on the road for every single game. It's still not going to be easy. They're still going to have to deal with travel and all that. At least it's going to be within the East Coast uh, because of uh, the way the MLB has realigned divisions uh, as we come into the break. Certainly not a good look for the Blue Jays. But as I said, if you had to bet on it, if you can find a line in some sports book somewhere, Definitely put some money on the Blue Jays playing their home games in Buffalo. Call them the Buffalo Blue Jays. 2020 Sports Break will be right back. Just another reminder that you can call the show at 352-639-0036 or leave us a message or add us on Twitter at WHBC Stream uh, at 940. Uh, 2020 Sports Break, here it is. HBC. Some MLB exhibition games that are further in action. 
the bottom of the seventh, it is the Cubs four, Twins three. Uh, the Blue Jays and Red Sox game got canceled halfway through, as we said. The Rockies and Rangers are tied in the fifth inning at three. And the only other game going in the sixth inning, it is the Brewers three, White Sox one. We will be right back. Buckle in, sports fans. You're listening to The William Haynes Show. The program will be starting in just a couple of minutes, so grab your popcorn and get ready to enjoy the show. While you're waiting, make sure you're following us on social media at WHBC Stream and staying tuned to WHBCStream.com. We're so glad to have you today on the program and we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line on Twitter or call the show 352-639-0036. And thanks again for tuning in. HBC and at 944 we are back on the William Haynes show after a short break and remember you can call the show at 352-639-0036 WHBC stream is a Twitter and if you're listening on Spreaker which of course you must be you can leave us a chat 
a message in the chat in there as well. We have got a couple more quotes uh, from ESPN about uh, the new Betts deal. Um, one thing from Alan Gonzalez, uh, the Dodgers and Mookie Betts uh, began broaching the subject of an extension around the middle of March before the shutdown and picked these talks back up five or six days ago. The two sides worked late into the night and fi- until finally getting to the right place on Tuesday. So that's a little bit interesting that they worked. They wanted to make sure this deal was done before the season. So that's good for Mookie in case anything happens to him this year injury-wise. He's got that 13-year contract. Um, of course, you know no player wants to play in that one-year deal, especially a, a caliber like Bet. So he gets it locked up. And Andrew Friedman, former um, general manager of the Tampa Bay Rays, he's the president of Dodgers Baseball Ops, and said he made the Mookie Betts trade with more than 2020 in mind. We appreciated the risk that came with that, but we did it with our eyes wide open and a commitment from all of us that we were going to do everything that we could to try and keep Mookie here for the rest of his career. And that, and they, <laughs> with that 13 year year contract, you better believe Mookie Betts is going to be wearing Dodger blue until he calls it quits. Um, 29, I believe, 29 year season uh, this year. That deal is going to put him into his early 40s, I, I believe. Um, I don't know. I would, Yeah, I guess if the one-year contract is going to stay, that would put him in early 40s. And as he gets older, you are not going to be able, after he's 35, you are not going to be able to move that contract. Um, and they're probably not just going to eat dead money. So, Mookie Betts, if you, if you live in Los Angeles and you work for the Dodgers, get used to that mug because he's going to be the face of your franchise. Uh, for a long time, they're paying him the big bucks, almost $400 million. So the Dodgers and Mookie Betts agree on that long-term extension. So he's going to be there for a while and definitely in the short term help them. I think they're at least going to win the National League, if not the whole darn thing uh, this year. Their lineup, their their pitching staff, their starting pitching staff, and even their bullpen to an extent has some good players in it. And I think they're really the team to beat. But we'll talk about that a little bit later in the show. As I said, over-unders on win totals. We'll give you all that. All MLB predictions. M- regular season baseball is tomorrow. The Yankees-Nationals game that we'll probably talk a little bit as well. And rounding up the news, we did just catch up. We talked Betts extension plenty. Mets Mark Stroman tearing the calf. He'll be out for a while. Their starting rotation is in shambles. And the Blue Jays now will not be able to play their home games at PNC Park. Uh, that was the plan after the Canadian government said no to them playing in Rogers Center in Toronto. So now they are looking at minor league facilities. Buffalo, Dunedin are the top candidates or just playing all games on the road. And now as we talk some Rays news, <clears throat> some Rays lineup questions. You know, the, everyone that follows the Rays, the beat writers, everything, they're trying to get a sneak peek, a little bit idea of what the lineup is going to be. G-Man Choi... Um, in the exhibition game that was televised uh, yesterday, that was Tuesday night, he led off uh, for the home team, uh, the team wearing the dark blue jerseys. I want to say Snell uh, went for them as he's getting his final tune-up before his start uh, on Sunday against the Blue Jays. Um, so G. Choi led off. Um, Austin Meadows, he was the guy that led off the season at the beginning of last year. If you remember in opening day 2019, he led the whole thing off, the whole season off with a home run and was hot, I believe, April. He was the American League Player of the Month, and I think he got the honors in September as well. I don't think he was batting uh, leadoff late in the season, but certainly early when he was having a success in March, April, and even May. I think it was actually May, maybe when he got that award. I'm not sure. But he was real, He was red hot to start the season, of course. As we know, he's not going to be with the team. He tested positive for COVID-19. So however long it takes it to get out of his system until he can get those two negative tests, uh, Austin Meadows is not going to be playing for the race. So that leaves that leadoff spot wide open. And G-Man Choi, uh, definitely not a guy who is fast as a conventional leadoff hitter is. But if we know anything about the Rays, we know that they are far from conventional. They have um, messed with having G-Man Choi at leadoff a little bit uh, last year. I believe even a couple games in 2018 after they had acquired him from the Brewers. The Brewers are a team. I got the game on the monitor uh, Brewers and White Sox. Brewers are up 3-1 for what it counts. But seeing Eric Sogard at bat uh, and seeing um, Avisail Garcia catching some balls in the outfield, it is strange to see a couple of former Rays that definitely helped the team in 2019 go elsewhere. We'll talk about the Brewers um, a little bit later. But getting back to G-Man Choi, um, he's probably, I don't want to say the favorite, but probably a good candidate to lead off. They also like Brandon Lau and Yoshi Satsugo. 
a couple of lefties um, along with Choi against right-handed pitching. So it looks like, I mean, it makes sense that you want to get the righty-lefty advantage, uh, at least in the leadoff spot. Um, so against right-handed pitching, that looks like it would be the case. Now on opening day, Hinji and Rue, a left-handed pitcher, probably not G-Man Choi to lead off or Brandon Lau or Yoshi Tsutsugo, um, for that matter. If you had to ask me who would lead off as we look at uh, the Rays roster, trying to find probably the best right-handed bat uh, that they have. Willie Dom is going to hit for some contact. Yandy Diaz, he led off, uh, that, of course, that American League wildcard game with a home run. Um, you Maybe you would have him in the leadoff spot. Jose Martinez, uh, we, a guy that we talked about who came back from the COVID-19. He got that positive test on the intake uh, and didn't come back until this week. He went 3-for-3 three three, um, in that inner squad game. So I would probably say he's a good contact hitter. I would be inclined to put him in that leadoff spot if you do have him in the lineup you would probably be putting him at first base and not having g-man Choi play on opening day which maybe i mean i don't know how much the race they're not conventional they're, they don't care about having the fan favorites and all that on opening day they just want to get every advantage they can so probably jose martinez to lead it off um in the opener just because the, the blue jays um ace hinchin rue is a lefty so you want that advantage of course, the leadoff hitter is all about you know hitting for contact, getting on base. Um, so I think probably I would say put Jose Martinez in that spot, uh, a guy that's not fast either, uh, as we were talking about G-Man Choi. Some infield work today in Tropicana Field included Yoshi Tsutsugo at third base, Yandi at first base. Um, Yoshi Tsutsugo, the left-handed bat, Yandi the righty. Um, Yandi Diaz was a guy, mainly DH, especially when he came back from injury, um, but a guy that can play first and third, he's not great at third. I know he played on opening day last year and at times when they needed him, uh, Matt Duffy played third base in the second half of the year. Eric Sogard spent some time. They have a lot of versatile infielder, Joey Wendell, um, and Daniel Robertson can play there as well. Um, but if Yoshi Susugo, a guy also that they, they worked at third today, they've been working him at third base in spring training. He was a first baseman. In the Japan League, of course, he's, he'll be making his Major League debut um, on opening day, uh, signing that two-year $12 million deal. So they're continuing to try and work him at third. He also reportedly can play the corner outfield, so he has some versatility. I'm not sure how great defensively he is. They sign him as a power bat, um, but they're continuing to get him work at third base. And a lefty, I think, maybe um, looking at the infielders, I don't know if Daniel Robertson is going to make that opening day roster. I don't think they've announced that already. He's a righty. Maybe you platoon him um, with Yoshi, or I would say probably just have Yandi. Uh, as Yandi's the righty, Yoshi the lefty. You can platoon them at third base. And then, of course, you've got uh, Jose Martinez and G-Man Choi, the platoon at first. I know you can't carry a load of infielders. And speaking of how they're going to carry pitchers, um, it's not the typical 25 man roster that we've seen in years past because of, you know, the situations pitchers aren't going to be stretched out. Players only had three weeks to get ready for the season compared to the five to six weeks that they would have in spring training. The Rays are undecided if they're going to carry 16 or 17 pitchers and also another rule, another wrinkle in. It doesn't have to be balanced. Of course, you know, you don't have to have 15 pitchers, 15 batters as that's the way it's been uh, with any number uh, of roster players. So the Rays we're expected to go pitcher heavy, and to which extent we do not know yet, either 16 or 17. Oliver Drake, a guy, or not Oliver Drake, but Colin Poche, a guy that we talked about last night. He was He's out for the season, torn UCL, Tommy John surgery. He's out until late 2021 at best, and talks today, unfortunately, probably will not be back until the start of the 2022 season. A guy that they acquired um, in a trade from the Diamondbacks in 2018, a guy that they brought up. I think it was June or July of last season. Uh, mainly fastball pitchers, four seams at around 95, but he did a really good job of getting lefties out. Um, so, And the Kevin Cash said they're going to sorely miss him, so that tells you everything you need to know about him. And we were talking about some relievers, uh, potentially, that were going to replace him. He does like the righty Oliver Drake of getting lefties out, and he had mentioned uh, Peter Fairbanks as well, another righty, but he likes him against lefties. Another thing that's going to be different about managing this bullpen, uh, a new rule. We talked about this last night as well. I don't want to hammer it too much in uh, for our listeners that are with us every day. Uh, but the new rule this year, this is not COVID-19 related, 
uh, but the MLB instituting the three batter minimum rule before you know you can t you can change pitchers as much as you want. Now the rule is you put a reliever in, like for example, Blake Snell starts on opening day. You take him out. You put in Jose Alvarado in. Jose Alvarado has to see at least three batters. Doesn't matter hits, walks, strikeouts, whatever. He will have to see three batters before you can put in another reliever. The cav the caveat to that is if uh, say uh, Blake Snell gets you two outs in the inning and you bring Jose Alvarado, you you think he can get that last out and he does. He only faces one batter, one up, one down. If he, if he finishes an inning, you can put in a different guy and that kind of t supersedes a three batter minimum. But having those lefty or righty specialists like they've had in the past, Colin Poche was a guy that you know they would put in for one batter or if you know there was two lefties in a row, three lefties, Kevin Cash say, all right, go get these lefties out. And even if you can't get him out, we're pulling you. We're not going to let you face a righty. That's all going to change, and I think that rule is going to change how a lot of teams stack their lineups. They'll you know, they'll stagger it a lot of left, right, left, right um, to make it hard. Um, so that way you're really going to have to pick your poison. And Kevin Cash, he I, the Rays playing matchups better than anybody. I mean, how much how much foresight they have? I mean, managing that bullpen and knowing when to take the starter out and knowing how they're going to line up the bullpen. If I trust any team to handle this rule, it's them. I think this rule was designed to kind of hamstring some of the stuff that the Rays would do. Um, like a guy like Adam Kalerik, I know, he, he was pretty much the textbook definition of a one-batter specialist. A sidearm guy got a ground ball, but he did not have great stuff. Uh, they brought him in. They, like, they bought him for cash from the Phillies. I mean, he was not... Um, that's just cash. Um, I'm trying to think of the word. Not Kevin Cash, but cash, uh, as in just you know a couple hundred thousand dollars or whatever. Uh, not a guy that had great stuff, but he could get a lefty out, and that's what they would do. And we saw in a game in 2018, I believe, against the Nationals, they brought Adam Kalerik in. He got an out, and in order to keep to, they wanted to keep Adam. They wanted Adam Kalerik to face the following batter, not the next one. So they put Kalerik at first base. They put Jose Alvarado at pitcher. Alvarado, I think, gets out Harper, and then they put Kalerik back in. And I think the teams were seeing that stuff happen, and they just they teams don't innovate like the Rays, and they just they instead of innovating to match the Rays, they just want to make rules uh, to kind of prevent the Rays from doing it. But I think uh, the Rays will find a way. Um, a couple other guys that can get lefties out: Jalen Beeks, who's more of a I think they want to be a bulk inning guy, um, but they, if they have to use him in the back of the bullpen, whatever. Alvarado, a guy who can get lefties and righties out, but he is a lefty pitcher. And Aaron Loop, a guy, he's 30, 32 years old now, um, but a guy that he was questionable if he was going to make the opening day roster. They had announced it, and then after that, Poche um, was out with the UCL. So I, maybe they knew before, maybe they didn't, but if they didn't, maybe a nice vote of confidence for Aaron Loop, but he's a guy uh, that they're going to have to lean on to get lefties out. And after that, that's it. Those are all the relievers. Um, Ryan Yarbrough, I anticipate to be a starter, um, at least for the start of the season. If he has struggles, of course, you'll move him uh, to the to the bullpen, probably being more of a bulk guy like he was in his rookie year. But I think he's got to the point. He's 28 years old now. I think he can uh, start. That looks like how the rotation is going to line up like we talked about. it. We'll go, th we'll go through it one more time. Uh, you have Charlie Morton on opening day, um, Ryan Yarbrough in game two on Saturday, and then you have um, Blake Snell going on Sunday. After that, you would assume that you would have, let's see, Tyler Glass now go on game one against the Braves. And then that five spot is wide open. Yanni Chirinos, we do not expect, uh, will be able to um, be good to go the first time through uh, the rotation. Uh, he was dealing with COVID-19, I believe, on the intake. He was not seen um, until I think a week this week or maybe last week he was seen. So a starting pitcher, I know it's going to be different. Starting pitchers are not going to give you a lot their first couple times through. Uh, but I think even to get three or four innings from Chirinos is a big ask. So whether they go, whether, I mean, they can start Chirinos and give him two innings, maybe three, and then just go bullpen day from there. I'm not sure um, what they would do. I would assume a bullpen day of some sort before you go back over to Morton. So that fifth starter is going to be a bit hard to kind of piece. Maybe you give a guy like Jalen Beeks um, a start. And the roster I'm looking at, I realize as I'm looking at, isn't complete. There's guys like Shane McClanahan. Um, from, uh, he was a USF grad, a local product. A guy that they believe maybe can be that fifth starter. 
at least the first time or the first couple times through the rotation until uh, Chirinos is good to go. Um, they've got a lot more pitchers than they would normally, so that'll give them um, some maneuverability as we head to another 2020 sports break. We're going to take another break, uh, get you these, the scores that are going on the exhibition, and we'll be right back. Remember, you can call the show at 352-639-0036 or drop us a line at WHBC Stream on Twitter and leave us a message in the chat at Spreaker.com, whatever you please. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes, but first, uh, here's the update. HBC Sports. Couple exhibition games coming to a close. Another one getting underway. Through eight innings, it is the Cubs up on the Twins, uh, four to three. Bottom of the sixth inning in Arlington, the Rangers are down. They're losing to the Rockies by a score of three to seven. In the sixth inning, it is the Brewers up on the White Sox, three to one. In a game that has just gotten underway, uh, the Padres and Angels no score. Um, at the top of the second inning, some scores that are final from today. Marlins up 6-2. to two. That was final against the Braves. Cardinals win over the Royals 6-3. to three. Indians 5, Pirates 3. And finally, the Reds 2-1 to one over the Tigers. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Hey, sports fans. William's currently in the can, but he'll be right back. We're currently on a commercial break, so don't touch that dial. Remember... You can call us at 352-639-0036 or drop us a line on Twitter at WHBC Stream to tell us what's on your mind. We want to talk sports. We want to get unruly. We want you to tell us what you think so we can argue. Anyway, when all that's said and done, please stay tuned for Williams World Famous Around the XFL podcast and other projects that he's currently got in the works. Please visit whbcstream.com, and thanks again for listening in.
HBC. And at 10.04, we are back on the William Haynes Show, stretching back out just like a starter in this 2020 MLB season, going from one hour the past couple nights to two hours, taking you up until 11 p.m. Eastern time. Call it William Haynes after dark, uh, if you will. Uh, in the second hour of the program, remember, I'll keep reminding you until I get some phone calls. You can call the show at 352-639-0036. You can drop us a line at Twitter at WHBC Stream and leave us a chat at Spreaker.com where you're listening to the show. Um, we've talked some news. I'll give you another rundown real quick. Betts signing a 13-year, $392 million extension supersedes the $360 million that Trout had received a couple months ago. Marcus Stroman has torn his calf, so he's going to miss the season. That definitely hurts the Mets' rotation uh, quite a bit. Uh, Blue Jays have denied uh, being able to play in PNC Park. The uh, Pennsylvania government has said no uh, to that, so they're going to have to look elsewhere, minor league facilities in Buffalo, in Dunedin, or they just play all their games on the road. That's pretty much the only plan of action left for them. And then we talked Rays. Uh, with no Austin Meadows to open the season, who will be the leadoff guy? Kevin Cash um, likes G-Man Choi. Brandon Lau and Yoshi Tsutsugo, um against right-handed pitching, which is obviously what the Rays will see more often than not on opening day. We expect Jose Martinez to lead off, but no official word on that. That's just my personal guesswork. Also some word from Rays camp. Yoshi getting some work at third. Yandi at first base. And the Rays will carry either 16 or 17 pitchers uh, for the first two weeks of the season on the 30-man uh, roster. And now that we have done all that, we've got a couple um, of race notes that I wanted to go over quickly. And then in the final hour of the program, we will spend the time uh, going over all 30 MLB teams, giving you my predictions, the over-under win totals, um, all of that. Um, something that we had talked about uh, the last couple of days, um, a note that I saw this in the uh, 2020 uh, Rays baseball preview in the Times on uh, in the Sunday paper. Uh, during the 1995 uh, strike, where they you know they did not get the full season in, when they finally agreed to terms to come back to play, they had three weeks uh, to get ready, and that's the same as the three weeks of summer camp that MLB has had. Uh, this year, in the first month of that 1995 season with with the shortened preseason, starters went six innings, 46.1% of the time. Now, the year previous, where they had a full six-week spring training, starters went six innings, 64.3% of the time. So that's about a 20% difference. And that was at a time oh, when starters went a lot deeper in games. Of course, in the 90s, you know, guys were still going complete game uh, quite often, uh, at least compared to uh, today. Um, so I think that that's worth note. I think you're going to see that even at a bigger difference, uh, teams lately, the past few years, they've been more and more conservative with how they want to keep their starting pitching healthy, uh, during a long 162 game season and into the playoffs, I guess in that regard, they can afford to be a little more aggressive, but on the other side of that coin, without the six full weeks of spring training to stretch guys back out, you can't have a guy like Charlie Morton in spring training, go one inning out the first time, two innings three innings, four innings, five innings, and then on opening day, he can go six or seven. Um, they don't have that luxury this time out. So you will see starters go three or four innings, uh, maybe five if they are efficient the first time through. We've seen guys like Charlie Morton admit, you know, he's the opening day starter the first time in his career. He feels weird because he knows opening day start, he cannot go seven innings, 100 pitches. His arm is just not ready uh, for that yet. It'll take probably a couple turns through before he is at that level. So I think the Rays, that plays to their advantage because of the bullpen and the way that the Rays know they can line guys up out of the pen. The expander roster also helps. I mean, every team has that advantage. Uh, 30 uh, players the first couple weeks, and then it's down to 27. Uh, and then the two weeks after that, I want to say 25 players. Uh, so it will get down um, eventually, but the Rays do have the advantage at least until starters can. I mean, by the, by the time the first two weeks, and definitely by the time the first four weeks uh, of the season is underway, the starters will probably be stretched out all the way, being able to go five, six, even seven innings for a guy like Morton, hopefully Snell, and guys like Glasnow 
um, as well. You know, Ryan Yarbrough, a guy who went eight and two thirds last season in Seattle, that controversial decision to pull um, Yarbrough out. I think it was like a one nothing game, so it, it it's explainable, it's understandable. Uh, but that not to get off on a, a whole other thing, as I tend to do, but it goes to show you even a guy like Yarbrough, when he's fully stretched out, uh, can go deep in a ball game, uh, albeit against a bit of a weaker lineup. Some scheduling notes for the race. We talked about this a couple of nights ago. Um, a tw- the toughest stretch of the season is a 20-game stretch between August 4th and August 24th. So that's really right at the beginning of the season. They have... Um, a homestand where they'll play the Blue Jays and the Braves, and then they'll go on the road in the Braves. And then after that, August 4th to August 24th, it's versus Boston. So uh, at home versus Boston, at home versus the Yankees, at Boston, at Toronto, at Yankees. So all American League East, um, those are the best teams that the American League has to offer this year. That's out of the race. That would be the Yankees, the Blue Jays, and then I would put the Red Sox behind them. Uh, but as far as schedule goes, that's as tough as it's going to get, and the Rays are going to get those games early. Hard to tell if that puts them at an advantage or a disadvantage. Um, if everyone's healthy, that's an advantage, but if the pitchers aren't ready, it could be a disadvantage. Um, we will see. 60-game um, season, that is 30% of a 162-game season, and as we mentioned, each game now is about worth what we used to know in a full season, about three games. Um, so that is pretty significant. The extra inning rule. Um, now, the, the Major League Baseball has tested this in their minor league system. In order to shorten games, of course, the Rays have had their fair share. They've had an 18-inning game, a 15-inning game um, the past couple years, I believe. I think the Twins, yeah, they went like 15 innings. Um, I think their franchise record was 18 innings, but that was uh, quite a few years ago. I, w- I mean, 18 innings, that's the length of two full baseball games in one night. Uh, unnecessary stress, in my opinion. Um, baseball traditionalists will say you just play that game until it's finished. But baseball came up with an idea that they've tested with success in the minor leagues. Um, if it's through nine innings and you're tied, top of the tenth, no outs. They put a runner at second base. The guy that records the final out in the bottom of the ninth, he goes right to second base as a base runner with no outs. In the top of the 10th, and you play it that way until you determine a winner. Um, in 2019, in the major leagues, um, when there was a runner on second base with no outs, so whether it's a leadoff double, walk and moving him over, walk and a steal, single and a steal, whatever, if there's a man at second base, nobody outs, that, that runner comes across the score 60.8% of the time. So definitely you're not going to see any of these 18 inning games anymore those are rare but you know getting in even getting into 11 12 13 innings i don't think you're going to see that as much this year and and that's for the best uh the health the reason they do that the health guidelines uh dictate that they do not have those players together for too long of course it makes sense the longer those people are exposed to each other the more likely if one of them has the virus you know that they would be spreading it uh, to each other i think there's going to be a lot of strategy in that strategy In that, uh, if anyone can figure it out, I think it would be the Rays. There's a lot of wiggle room on how teams can choose to approach this, both offensively and defensively. Uh, We'll talk offensively first. I mean, you got a runner at second, nobody out. Um, It, I would say, it's a little different whether you're at the top or the bottom of the inning. If you know, if you're ready, if you can walk it off um, in the bottom of the inning, I mean, I would assume you're going to bunt him over. If you can, if you got a guy that can bunt and then a sack fly with one out, I mean, that's going to bring him in. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of that. I know that's been a big gripe for more baseball traditionalists, but even just baseball fans um, in general, that there's not enough bunting in MLB anymore. I would agree with that. I mean, it is a nice wrinkle, a nice strategy. It happens more in the National League. If you can get a guy on base and you got the pitcher coming up and you don't want to change him, you just have the pitcher bunt the guy over, uh, hit and run, that kind of stuff. I think... Now that teams are going to have to start practicing that again, uh, now that the MLB has become all about hitting as many home runs as you can, strikeouts don't matter, just hit long balls. Uh, I think now that teams are going to have to practice this bunting because you have to be prepared because a couple extra inning games in a 60-game season could decide your season. So it's the uh, how much you prepare I think will affect teams greatly. I think that goes to the advantage of teams with better managers. 
uh, Rays included with Kevin Cash, one of the best in the business. Um, so more bunting, and then defensively, and I think this is something the Rays are going to get absolutely wild with, with the intentional walk. Why not walk the first guy, especially if he's a good hitter, um, or even if he's not, it doesn't matter. Put a guy there so that way you can get the double play. So let's say if it's the Rays and it's the tenth inning, and you intentionally walk the first guy, and you put in a guy like Ryan Yarbrough, or I mean he's probably going to be a starter, but a guy like that that can get ground balls, and that's his specialty, and that's what the stats on your stat sheet says that he's going to do more often than not. If you can get a ground ball in turn two, sure that guy's standing over at third base, but any out in you know you come out of the the inning without scoring any without giving up any runs, strike out, ground out, fly out, don't doesn't matter. Uh, you don't longer have to worry about that sacrifice fly. I think you're going to see that a lot. I think um, if there's one or two outs and you don't like the hitter, I could see teams loading the bases up, especially uh, if it's in the bottom of the inning and they already have a run. If you can give a run, you know, load up the bases and get a guy or you know, just make sure you have an out at every base. I think you're going to see a lot of that happen, especially with teams that are playing more loose like an Orioles or a Marlins. Um Maybe more so Marlins that just want to get wild with it and get wins where they can. You'll see a lot of stuff like that. Um, so to to the traditionalists that are against this, I would just I would give them that. I would say uh, I think there's a lot of fun that can come from this. Uh, and as, as I mentioned in my monologue, instead of looking at the negatives, let's look at the positive. Sure, the rule is different, like it or not. Um, it's going to make games shorter, which is certainly what the MLB is trying desperately to do, as we see with all these rule changes uh, to make the game go by quicker. Um, but I think the games that go to extra innings are going to be a lot more interesting. A lot of times games go into extras and you're like, all right, uh, it's, it becomes home run derby at that point. Um, because the first, you know, you score a run, no matter what, you know, the top of the inning, you're probably going to win the game. And at the bottom of the inning, obviously if it's tied, it's a hundred percent chance you're going to win the game. So at that point, guys just start going for home runs, and that's how you see those games go 13, 14, 15 innings is instead of just trying to play your game, players just want to end it with one swing. And I think this rule changes that up quite a bit, puts strategy, puts small ball uh, back into play. And I think we'll see a trickle. I don't know uh, how that would work if you consider that a trickle down or a trickle up effect. Um, but I think to put it another way, I mean, you're just going to see small ball uh, take a hold back into Major League Baseball, at least for a guy like me, that's hopefully, uh, depending on if, if you like the home runs or strikeouts, if you like the three run, the three uh, uh, major outcomes, you don't like it. If you're like me and you like, you know, getting on base, moving runners over, scoring them in on a single situational baseball, I think that's going to bring that back into our lives to go off on a, a little side note there. Um, but the stats, uh, runner on second base, no outs in the 2019 season, the runner scored 60.8% of the time. I'd probably expect that to go up uh, with teams practicing it more. Um, something I mentioned again in the monologue, 104 games played by July 24th in 2019. I know, I mean, you can do the math, obviously 60 games instead of 162 two game season, you can shave the games off. But I think when you put it that way, if COVID-19 had not had taken hold, we would have been 100 games into the season. I think that's crazy to think about. Baseball has been out of our lives uh, for so long, and I think no matter how we can get it, no fans, crazy rules, you know, guys being out with COVID-19, whatever, if they deem it's worth the risk, I say just be happy and watch the games, listen to the games on radio, however you like to do it, uh, but just be happy that baseball is back. Um, all 10 Yankee games on a 28-day stretch. Of course, that starts in that 20-game stretch we had mentioned in August. Uh, they have a home series, and then they go to the Bronx in that 20-game all-ALE stretch. Uh, and then, of course, the that would probably be another four games uh, would follow in the next, uh, I guess, 15 days or so. And uh, one thing about the Rays roster, actually a couple things um, as we go through these notes, 33.1% of all home runs hit in 2019 are gone. And I that's Avisel Garcia, Tommy Pham, Travis Darno, and a couple others, but those were the main ones. Um I would say there's a couple ways to look at this. If you want to, you know, be a downer, the you know, those are major players that really helped this team. When this team was like went five hundred, they went thirty and thirty. 
during that 60-game stretch. They had all their starting pitching except for Charlie Morton out. That team was stagnant. You had guys like obviously Obvious Al Garcia, Tommy Pham, Travis Darno help them, hitting some home runs, get hit, it's timely hits, whatever it was. Um, and those players are all gone. Obviously Al Garcia, you know, a guy that they signed from the Chicago White Sox, a guy that they knew they could turn into a more productive player. I think they only got him for like, it was like $5 million or I want to say even less than that. Uh, they got a really good deal because he looked decent in Chicago. Um, but he had a monster season, like 20 home runs. I think hit like high, I want to say it was like 260, 270 was his average. And then, of course, he signs a deal uh, to Milwaukee. Uh, I think the Rays would have liked to give him around, but they're okay. They like their outfield uh, situation as it is, but he's gone. Tommy Pham, of course, they trade him uh, to the San Diego Padres in exchange for Renfro uh, and Xavier Edwards. And then Travis Darno, of course, a guy that they traded for cash considerations from the Dodgers. Got him for basically nothing. He had not hit, recorded a hit so far that season. He had been DFA'd by the New York Mets. Um, really a low point in his career. They had brought him in just because um, Mike Zanino was hurt. I think Michael Perez, yeah, Michael Perez had gone down as well. You didn't have catcher, so the Rays just needed a body, a backstop. They bring in Travis Darno. All of a sudden, he goes off hitting home runs. And these humongous spots. I mean, he had multiple walk-off home runs. He had three home runs in one game in Yankee Stadium. And at one of the best Rays games in the past few seasons, no doubt. I mean, he carried the team in that game and really throughout the season. Now, I will say, he was not great in the postseason, but he won a big reason. <laughs> I mean, if the Rays did not make that trade, uh, I believe in May, in late May, the Rays would not have gone to the postseason. Uh, just plain and simple, without... Travis Darno. So those guys are all gone. He signs, I think he got like twelve million for the Braves, so good for him. Unfortunate the Rays can't keep him in. Uh, but of course they like what they have in Mike Sanino, um, who's poised, I would say, to have a good season. He's looked great. Um in summer training. The other side of that coin, you know, obviously a third of those home runs are gone, but certainly uh replaced. The first, the easiest one, Tommy Pham for Hunter Renfro, that trade, that straight up trade, you are getting more home runs this year out of Hunter Renfro than you would for Tommy Pham. That was a trade intentionally made uh, to give up speed, contact, and potentially defense. I'm not sure how the stats work out. Um, four power, four home runs. Um, Hunter Renfro, who hit 33 home runs in the National League West uh, for the San Diego Padres last season. He's one of the more revered power hitters. He's not up there in the conversation, of course, with the best of the best, but a good power hitter. And the Rays, like... After 2017, after they traded guys like Steven Souza, Corey Dickerson, Longoria, they moved away from that home run heavy uh, offensive mentality. But then you see in 2018, 2019, you struggle sometime with runs. They had the lowest ERA in all of baseball, uh, especially out of the bullpen, I believe. Uh, but struggle to score runs in key moments at times. I think they decide the stats show. I mean, that's why baseball has gone this way. You have to score home. You have to hit home runs sometimes to score runs. Um, excuse me. Sometimes when you can't uh, string hits together and you can score a run with one swing of the bat, that can help you out of slumps, all kinds of stuff. So the Rays have intentionally moved more towards the home run. Hunter Renfro <clears throat> is one example of that. And one guy they brought in as a free agent, two years, $12 million deal. I mean, I know $6 million a year is not a lot, but the Rays do not give that to just anybody. Yoshi Satsugo, a guy... Uh, one of the big, I, I obviously I don't follow Japan League Baseball, but Yoshi Satsugo is one of the stars in the league. It took $12 million to lure him into the United States and into a place he's not familiar with. Uh, and a place, you know, obviously he would probably rather stay in Japan, but it took him that money to lure him out. A uh, guy that can hit, all signs show that he's going to hit a ton of home runs. Maybe not this year, but next year in a full season. Um, he's going to make up a lot of those home runs. Uh, Jose Martinez, more of a contact guy, but he can hit some home runs as well. Uh, you look at that roster, you know, guys getting better. A guy like Brandon Lau, who's got a nice power swing to him. Um, look, um, looking at what they're going to do in the outfield. You're losing home runs, but I think the Rays have intentionally made moves to increase uh, the amount of home runs that they're going to hit. So I would say not as much um, to worry about that. And then the final note that I had... Um, and as well, Yanni Diaz, just another thing that I want to say, that's definitely going to help. If you can get him um, healthy for a full season, I think that's going to help. 
uh, certainly score some home runs because he was great last year, as we know. Um, the last thing I wanted to say, probably only three regular players we're going to see every day. Now, the third one, not anymore, certainly from the time that that article I read was written. written. Uh, Kevin Kiermaier, if he's healthy, hopefully he can through his 60-game season. Willie Adamas and Austin Meadows. Now, Austin Meadows, not as much, uh, but I would imagine probably Brandon Lau is going to take his spot as a contender maybe to play 60 games or close to in the regular season. Uh, Brandon Lau, uh, the guy that's expected to start in place of Meadows in right field and maybe in that leadoff spot as well, uh, but also was going to be the mainstay at second base. So, uh, But I would say everywhere else, uh, the Rays are going to get crazy with it. They're going to use the DH to their advantage to give guys like they did last year, quote-unquote, half days off. Um, a guy like Tommy Pham, when he was dealing with shoulder or elbow issues or whatever, um, when you can't, you don't need him in the field, but you want his bat, you want his speed on the base path, um, you just put him in that DH spot. You know, the Rays aren't one of those teams who have an everyday DH. They're not like, you know, the New York Mets, who, if they were smart, would only put uh, Ioannis Cespedes in the DH spot because of how injury-prone he's been. The last about 30 minutes of the show, just wanted to remind you, you can call us at 352-639-0036. Getting ready for all things baseball. Drop us a line on Twitter, WHBC Stream. Um, and leave us a message in the speaker chat as well uh, where you are listening to this. So the point of, of in saying that is just the Rays are going to move a lot of guys around. Yoshi Tsutsugo, Jose Martinez, we've been over it 100 times. Um, the roster is flexible. They have guys that can play the infield and the outfield, extremely versatile. Um, I don't know. Statistically, however, the Rays are just going to get crazy with it and don't expect a lot of everyday players outside of uh, Adamas at shortstop and probably Kevin Kiermaier in center field hopefully if he can stay healthy and now uh, 30 about 30 minutes in the show we're probably going to skip uh, the 2020 sports break um, coming in at um, 10 40 I think we did skip it at 10 20 I was blown right through it um, as we try and get all these MLB uh, predictions and I know it ran a little long on some of the race stuff but getting excited we'll probably be on um, tomorrow we'll see. I will talk about that a little later. But getting into the MLB predictions, we talked about we went over the NL in the Amer- in the American League East um, last night. But I just wanted to touch on it again to have it um, all in one place. Uh, we'll start with the American League first. Um, we'll do the win totals too. Starting at the bottom, over under is twenty and a half wins, and I got this. Um, I don't remember what sports book, but the lines fluctuate depending on what book if you're thinking about betting on some of these over-under totals. So definitely just shop whatever number you like. Um, but the Orioles, I have uh, finishing at fifth out of five teams in the American League. Um, 20 and a half is the over-under on wins. I would say probably go under. I would say I would expect their win total to be at about 16, 17 wins. They've lost 100 games in the past two years, and they they have cut down the roster even from those teams. Um, this is going to be an historically bad baseball team, I think disguised um, in a 60-game season. They're kind of going to get lost in the records books as one of the all-time bad teams. I mean, they have really cut this roster down to its bare bones. Nothing much else to say. And Finishing up fourth, I expect to be the Boston Red Sox, um, which is... it's. It's crazy to see. I mean, they win the World Series in 2018. They carry that entire roster in 2019. Total World Series hangover. Starting rotation is bad. Bullpen can't get anybody out. The offense is good, but it can't carry a team. you got to get guys out. And this rotation in 2020 is even worse than it was last year. You ship David Price out. Uh, Chris Sale is going to be out all year with Tommy John. If I, had to, if I asked you to guess what the ERA of the Red Sox opening day starter is, I mean, go ahead and guess, and I'll tell you right now, it was 5.99 last year, an ERA of 6 for their Red Sox opening day starter, Nathan Avaldi. Uh, you probably remember him from the Rays in 2018. They ship him over midseason, helps him win a World Series, but was not good at all last year. He's dealt with some injury issues, and that too, the Red Sox, their franchise say, look, we're handing this the ball to this guy on opening day. And this is who we trust to be the ace of our rotation in ERA of six. Uh, Ryan Weber um, is another guy. I mean, there there's names, but names that you probably would not recognize. Guys that, I mean, just have not proven themselves to get out in the major leagues. 
at the starting rotation. The bullpen, I think, is just as bad. You've got Brandon Workman in the back um, of the pen, but no one else really that you would trust on paper to get guys out. The offense is going to be okay. I mean, it's not going to be as good as it was last year now that Mookie Betts is gone. But you still have guys like J.D. Martinez. Rafael Devers will probably be a bit, a bit better as he continues to develop. Guys like Xander Bogarts um, and guys like that. But I would expect them to finish fourth. 31.5 is the over under a win total. That puts them right at a, over 500. I would say probably I would go under on that. I would expect them to win anywhere from 25 to 28 games. Um, I'll, I'll, write, I'll write some of this stuff down. Um, so I can come back to it uh, maybe after the season is done and we'll talk um, on the final day of the MLB season. Hopefully talk and Rays having clinched a playoff berth. Um, they definitely go under on 31 and a half. I would say if they finish at 500, that would be a miracle uh, with that rotation. They're the, I know they're the Red Sox and they're always going to compete. Fenway Park is going to be empty this year. They don't have that advantage. Um, and with Shane Bloom cutting that roster down, getting ready, I guess for a a rebuild. They were not ready to pay Mookie Betts four hundred million dollars, even though I'm sure they could have afforded it. But that trade shows you where the Red Sox are. They're in rebuild mode. Go under on the thirty-one and a half. They finish fourth in third place. I've got the Blue Jays. They their over under win total is actually lower at twenty-seven and a half. I would I would be inclined. I mean, mathematically, I guess I would have to say probably over. But I think twenty-seven is right about the Blue Jays would finish. That would put them at three games under 500. Uh, the Blue Jays, we've talked about them, and we're going to we're gonna talk about them. The Rays are seeing them in the drop the first three games of the year. We will get a good look at this team. Um, the new wrinkle is they're not going to have a home um, at all, or it's going to be a minor league stadium. I mean, just it's all, it's all, um, it's all straw on the back of the camel. Um, they're young. I would say that will play to their benefit and also their detriment, as we've seen with the Rays in 2018. That's who I would compare this team to. They they finished the rebuild, but it's still a year away. Uh, the Rays showed that in 2018. The prospects are going to go through some slumps. They're going to have to figure some stuff out. And a 60-game season does not give them a lot of wiggle room to do that, as we saw with the Rays in 2018. Almost made a playoff push there at the end, but just ran out of time. I think if that season had been a week or two weeks longer, they would have been a playoff team. Um, uh, Blue Jays are not going to have that luxury. It's right out of the gate. Every game matters. You're going up against you're going up against teams like the Yankees who are throwing Garrett Cole, and then they go to the bullpen, and it's Tommy Canley, uh, Zach Britton, Adam Ottavino, and then Adam Ch- uh, Aroldis Chapman if he comes back from the COVID nineteen. I mean, it's hard to keep, it's hard to set your feet. Uh, really in the dirt and get settled in when you've got when you're facing teams like that and every every game matters every team is tied for first place on July 23rd um, and I think that'll play to the the Blue Jays detriment they have young guys that'll be able to play loose and I think we'll be able to kind of offset um, just the uncomfortableness of playing on the road uh, but I think their bats are going to go through some slumps I mean they've got guys you can hit Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Gavon Biggio um, Bo Bichette, guys that we'll talk about all season long as being extremely, extremely t- tough outs. I mean, Travis Shaw, T. Oscar Hernandez, uh, Ryan, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, Danny Jansen, uh, the catcher who can hit. I mean, they've got guys who can hit the cover off of the baseball. Um, but I think they'll go through some slumps. I'm also not in love with their pitching staff. They have Hien Jin Ryu. They brought in a, a Cy Young finalist last year um, to be the ace of the rotation. Um, as Eric Sogard is thrown out at second base. Um, but outside of that, they don't have a lot of guys that love. Tanner Rourke, a guy who they brought in from Cincinnati, uh, is okay. And as you go down the list, I mean, it's not a lot of guys you're going to fall in love with. The bullpen, I don't love either. They do have some decent arms in there. Um, Aaron Sanchez, I believe, is one, if I'm not mistaken. I don't have the roster in front of me. Um, and a couple other guys uh, that they've held on to. They can get guys out, but it's not a great bullpen. It's not a great starting rotation, and if the bats go in a slump, um, they're not going to be able to have enough time to overcome it, but I do like their future. I mean, they're going to be good in 2021, and this year I'm going to have them better um, than the Red Sox. 27.5 for wins. Um, I'm going to be a little bit bullish. I want to say 28, 29 games, so give me the over, but I still think going to finish under or right around the 500 mark. 
And then we'll move quickly to the last two teams because we've talked to them ad nauseum. I may even run past 11 o'clock, uh, to be perfectly honest. We've got a lot of teams, a lot of divisions uh, left to get through. Um, but the Rays, their over-under is at 34 wins, which I think is laughably low. That is four games above 500. This was a team that won 96 games last year and could have easily won 100, had a couple of things broken their way. But I do have them at second in the division um, behind the New York Yankees. <laughs> I mean, I could. we've talked probably half the show about the Rays. I'll just go over them quickly again. Hitters, the lineup is good. It's better probably than it was last year. They're going to hit uh, some more home runs. So they'll be more balanced in that regard. They have contact. They have power. They have speed. Uh, they don't steal a lot of bases. They don't attempt those. That's not what the stats show works. Um but they have guys that can steal bases. You know, Kevin Kiermaier is a threat. He, if he gets on base with a single, I mean, a double is going to score him. It, it's stuff like that. Um, so with that power, Mike Zanino, I think, is a big factor in that lineup as well. Had his worst uh, season, at least at the plate, as a professional baseball player. Um, but he was a guy that the Rays brought in from Seattle, not just to be their everyday catcher and to be a good backstop, which he is a good defensive catcher, uh, by the way, but... A guy that could hit for power. If you can get 20, well, I say 20 home runs, but an equivalent. So let's say, I don't know, you get uh, six, seven. Well, um, yeah, five or five to seven home runs out of Zanino, which is about equivalent of 20 in a regular season. I mean, that is a huge boost and something you did not get last year. You Basically, you're talking about another Travis Darno if he can hit with that kind of power and, you know, doubles off the wall, you know, moving guys over. I think that's going to help a lot. If he if he can be back, and he, all indication is he's looked good uh, in summer training, and then the, the starting rotation, um, I mean when they're healthy, one through five, I mean put them up against anybody. That is the, one of the best top to bottom rotations in all of Major League Baseball. Um, lined by the ace Charlie Morton, Blake Snell, a guy that has won a Cy Young award, uh, Tyler Glass, now a guy who is on his way more than likely to the American League Cy Young trophy. Um, in 2019, before he went down with forearm uh, tightness, I believe, in May, and then came back to pitch in the postseason. He was okay. Um, the, the Rays lost both of the games that he started, um, but he looked decent. I mean, he's got a fastball. He, he can pitch high and tight to guys. and I mean, he'll go up some home runs, but that's a hard pitch to hit, and he's he's developed a nice curveball, I believe, a changeup and a slider. Um, he's trying to work into the mix as well. Not sure how, how much he's going to want to mix that in in the short season. And again, dealt with the COVID-19, uh, but he did pitch through it. He did have some symptoms, but the fact that he was pitching and trying to stay ready through it, um, I think he'll be ready. It might take him a couple times through the rotation to get through. And then in the back end, he got Ryan Yarbrough. Does not pitch hard. He tops out at about 85 um, or maybe high 80s if you really put the mustard on it on uh, a fastball. But a guy that's great at generating weak contact ground balls. You see the faith that they have in him. He's the second starter out of the gate against the Blue Jays. I think the multiple reason that's for he generating weak contact against a power lineup, but I think also he might be probably maybe the most ready to go. He's not dealt with injuries uh, so far in summer training. And Kevin Cash, if he, I mean, whatever pitcher is ready to go the deepest, you want first uh, to kind of give that bullpen a little bit of a rest. Um, so they like him. And then Yanni Torinos, if he comes back um, at some point in the season. Um, I, he's, he's reported back, I believe, but he's going to have to get built back up. Um, if he hasn't been pitching through the COVID-19, um, so if they can piece back that five starter, the bullpen is one of the best. I don't need to tell you what they do with the bullpen. It's great. Nick Anderson has helped a lot. Um, I think, um, the other guy that they got in that trade, Trevor Richards is going to help a lot as kind of a bulk guy. Jalen Beeks is another guy that can pitch behind an opener, I think, which is a great advantage to have during the season. So 34 wins easy give me the over on them and then at first place i mean i've seen people like raise podcasts and whatever obviously they're race homers they would love the race to win the american league east the i think that's laughable to have anyone but the new york yankees winning the american league east i think i mean i love the dodgers this year but i think the yankees are probably the best roster top to bottom in all of major league baseball They added a guy like Garrett Cole to their starting rotation, a guy that in all 
all fairness, probably should have won the Cy Young last year. And that, I mean, that is a little bit of postseason bias in there. Of course, Verlander got it, uh, but uh, Cole was right there. I mean, he won his. Um, he had 18 consecutive decisions go in the win column. That was including postseason. I mean, if you're a race fan, you watch those games that he pitched game two and game five, I believe, completely shut down the Rays lineup. He's your ace, probably one of the best pitchers in baseball. Masahiro Tanaka, um, he's going to miss some time. He was hitting them in the face or in the head with a line drive on the 4th of July. Um, he's probably going to miss the first time through the rotation, but he's a guy. I mean, he threw a complete game shutout in Yankee Stadium against the Rays last season. That tells you what he can do. Um, I'm trying to. Jordan Montgomery is a guy that's looked good. I saw him uh, against the Mets in an exhibition game. A guy like Jay Happ. Um, I'm trying to think who else they have. I mean, Chad Green is a good opener, and they've got one of the best bullpens in all of baseball as well. Um, looking at Aroldis Chapman, uh, typically their closer, one of the best relievers in baseball. He's going to miss at least the start of the season. He still has not gotten his two negatives as he has tested positive for COVID-19. They still do not have him back full or at all yet. So they're missing their closer, but they have a guy like Zach Britton who was a closer for the Orioles a few years ago who went to the postseason. So they do still have a, a, a top-notch quality closer in Zach Britton, but they're just going to have to slide the bullpen down. But you got have guys like Adam Adovino, um Tommy Canely, Chad Green was the guy that we mentioned. Um, they've got tons of guys that are just, I mean, that's that's what they said about the Yankees the past couple years. If you can't get to the Yankees by the fifth inning, forget about it. If they have the lead, I mean, they're locking it down with that bullpen. They've won 100 games the past few seasons. I think they're going to continue that equivalent. Obviously, you cannot win 100 games in a 60-game season. 37 and a half, I think, is an interesting over-under. I mean, say you go the over on that, that's eight games above 500, I think is nice. But I've seen people saying, you know, the Yankees are going to win 42, 43 games this year. Um, and I would honestly, I can't disagree with that. Give me the over on the 37 and a half. And I have the Yankees uh, winning the American League East and probably the American League, unless the Rays can shock the world this year, uh, which certainly we hope that they do. Um, and moving over to the National League East, um, some teams at the Rays and the Yankees and the Red Sox, all these guys are going to be playing in this new adjusted uh, division. We'll start at the bottom. A well-improved Marlins team. The over-under is at 24.5 wins. Um, they are they were pretty bad last year, but they're continuing their rebuild. They've had guys like Jonathan VR, and they have guys like um, Corey Dickerson, and um, uh, I'm, trying, I'm blanking on some names. Um, Caleb Smith, I want to say. Um, is a guy that they added um, in the rotation that's been good the last couple of years. Um, they, I, the additions that they've made is good, but not enough uh, to really compete. I think they're still going to be in the bottom. Uh, 24 and a half wins. Um, that's a tough one. I would say, because that would put you at about five games under 500. Um, so that's tough. 24 and a half, give me the under on that for the seller team in the National League East. And now this is where it gets tough now with the uh, the Mets news that broke today about uh, Marcus Stroman. Uh, that'll be missing some time. Um, at fourth place, I'm going to go with the Phillies. At Their over-unders at 31.5 wins. They have made some additions. I believe they were a 500 team last year, but they had Zach Wheeler. They had D.D. Gregorius. The weakness of that team, still the bullpen, um, but the starting rotation is a little bit better. Guys like Aaron Nola, now Zach Wheeler. Um, they have some other starters. And, you know, the, the lineup, I think, is really... I I, I I hesitate to put them at fourth because of what the lineup can do. They have the best catcher, undisputably, I would say, in baseball, and JT uh, Real Muto. Um, and they've got added guys like Reese Hoskins and, you know, of course, Bryce Harper. D.D. Gregorius is a guy that's going to be nice, uh, a nice hitter at shortstop. Top to bottom, I think the the, the Phillies honestly have one of the best lineups um, around. Uh, Thirty one and a half wins, and also Joe Girardi, the new manager, um, eh, replacing Gabe Kapler, who moved over to the San Francisco Giants. Uh, Girardi, I think, is with what he can do at the bullpen. We've seen what he's done with the Yankees. Um, worth a couple extra wins in a sixty game season. Thirty one and a half is tough. They finished right at a five hundred. I'm bullish on them. The bullpen might be their undoing. 
Um, but I, I heard on, on WFAN last night a caller had mentioned a good point. The past couple of years, in the first half of the season, the Phillies were lights out. They were well above 500. It was in the second half of the season when their bullpen and starting rotation got worn down that they started picking up the losses um, in bundles and bunches. So I think if the pitching can be just good enough and let this lineup do its thing, Zach Wheeler will help. Didi Gregorius will help. Give me the over on the Phillies um, at 31.5 wins at fourth place in the National League East. And at third place, now I've slid him down. The new news um, is the New York Mets. 31.5 is the over-under total. As far as wins are concerned, um, really great lineup. I think that's where you have to start. We talked about this earlier in the show. Great contact hitters in Conforto and Nimmo and Jeff McNeil. I think McNeil, I mean, th- those are all guys who would be great leadoff hitters. And then behind him, you've got uh, Pete Alonzo, who led the entire MLB in home runs as a rookie. Uh, he might come down a little bit, a little bit of a slump, but I think he'll still be a good power hitter. Uh, Robinson Cano, he's aging, but I mean, he's been a great hitter in his career. Having you on a cesspit is back. Hopefully, if they can keep him healthy. Um, that's a great addition if he can return to form. Of course, he hasn't played in a major league game in about two seasons. Um, and then you look, I mean, they've got guys on the bench like Dom Smith and um, blanking on some other guys, but they, they can move guys around. Um, I like what, They're going to be able to put up runs. The starting rotation is not what it was a couple months ago. Of course, Noah Syndergaard, who was supposed to be their number two starter, went down. He's had Tommy John surgery. Your number three starter, Marcus Stroman, uh, calf um, t- calf tear, which I don't love in a 60-game season. I don't really know how they're going to be able to get him back for much. I'll probably listen to the fan tonight and kind of figure out what the situation <clears throat> is on that. Um, that rotation is bare bones. It helps that your ace is it, you know, back-to-back Cy Young award winner Jacob deGrom. If he can stay healthy, that's going to help a lot. They're not going to want to push him out of the gate. Uh, he's been dealing with back stiffness. You want to keep him healthy and not, you know, jeopardize long-term future, um, especially if that's all you've got. And the guys behind that, um, Zach Wheeler left. That 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 definitely hurts, especially now. I'm sure the Mets are kicking themselves. The the coupons, uh, the Wilpon family, wishing they had ponied up that money to keep Zach Wheeler around. But Steven Matz was a guy who was okay for them as a starter. Uh, you probably put him in as your number two. Rick Porcello, a guy who's won an AL Cy Young but has not looked himself the past couple years. Um, Michael Waka, who is a former NLCS MVP but has not looked himself in the past the past few seasons either. And then the number five starter, they really do not have anyone right now they can put in. You, they're either going to have to bring in a guy from the minor leagues in their um, in their in their training camp, or they slide up a guy. Um, from the bullpen like Seth Lugo who started his Mets career out as a starter the reason they moved him to the bullpen is he is better reliever but you got to have someone start that fifth time out um, and I think Seth Lugo is the guy they talked about moving him to the rotation last year I think they're they're going to end up doing it this season um, don't love that rotation if anyone if any if any of those starters go down I mean if DeGrom goes down yeah the season is over they're already against odds anyway um, but the lineup's going to score a ton of runs. I like what they've done with the bullpen. Of course, the bullpen was supposed to be a strength last year. It ended up being a weakness. Uh, Robert Giselman, I think, missed some time with some injuries. Um, Edwin Diaz, who they brought in, they paid a king's ransom. In, re- in reality, they their top prospect, and they took on Robinson Cano's contract, basically for Edwin Diaz. And he was he led the American League in saves. Uh, the previous year in 2019 for the Mets, he was terrible. Uh, blew a bunch of saves. I was actually at a game in Philadelphia uh, visiting their ballpark in the Mets. And the Mets had a lead. And, of course, Edwin Diaz blew it. The Phillies walked it off, which was kind of cool to see. Um, but not a great season. Something I've heard talked about in New York circles is that no fans will help. That was That's what they presume was the downside of Edwin Diaz was that New York crowd he could not take the booze he could not take uh the negative spotlight being on him with no fans in the stands i think that might help a little bit not being booed walking off the field in new york and city field um if he can be anywhere close to what he was in 2018 i think he had like almost 50 saves that year that's gonna help a bunch they added a guy 
like Dylan Potences. They brought him over from the New York Yankees. He did not pitch. I think uh, he, I think he pitched like one inning or something crazy like that in in 2019. But he's a great reliever. He's got a great track record. Comes over, wants to stay in New York. Uh, he's going to play for the Mets this year. Um, Seth Lugo is a guy uh, who is going to be in the bullpen. He was lights out last year, but probably moving up to the starting rotation. Uh, Justin Wilson's another guy who's good at getting guys out. The bullpen should be a strength, especially if Edwin Diaz uh, can kind of return to his old form. Starting rotations is bare bones, as we said. Lineup is good, can put up a ton of runs. 31 and a half on the over-under on wins. Um, I like the Mets a lot. I don't like them as much now hearing what happened with Marcus Stroman. Um, that's, that is really tough. 31 and a half. I mean, in actuality, that, that, what I just described to you was a 500 team. So, um, I'm bullish though. I'm going to go, I'm going to go over on the 31 and a half, but obviously, um, more than the, the Phillies who I also went over on the 31 and a half. So I guess the Mets getting just enough, um, to get over there. And then at second place, um, we're going to go to a break. Uh, right after the National League East preview as we continue to go through 11 o'clock and into the wee hours of the night here on the eve of MLB opening day. Um, but finishing in second place in the NL East, I have the Washington Nationals. I'm predicting a little bit of a World Series hangover um, for them. That happens every year. We saw a textbook example last season with the Boston Red Sox. Um, same roster carryover from 2018 to 2019, and they... I mean, they still finish over 500, but in a lot of ways, they fell flat in their face. The pitching cannot hold up. I mean, that was an old pitching staff, though. A guy like David Price is past his prime. Nathan Avaldi, who's their ace this year, um, that, you know, is past his prime. It's a little different for the Nationals. They keep their starting three intact. I mean, they have one of the best one, two, three punches. Um, and Anibal Sanchez is a nice number four starter. So one of the best rotations, but easily the best one, two, three in all of MLB. Max Scherzer, um, the guy, the World Series MVP, Steven Strasburg and Patrick Corbin rounding it out. All three presumably going to be ready to go. We're going to see Max Scherzer tonight or tomorrow night, I should say, um, facing the New York Yankees lineup. So that, I mean, that's must see TV. We'll probably talk about that um, if we're on tomorrow uh, during the uh, Dodgers Giants game. Um, but for the Nationals, I mean, yeah, the starting rotation, as I said, Anibal Sanchez is a nice number four. So the rotation is good. The bullpen, I would say, is okay. It was certainly a weakness for them last year. And even in the postseason, they had to lean. They had to bring those three starters out of the bullpen dang near every game. It was crazy how much stress they put on them. I think if this season started in March, I would have counted the Nats out. But the fact that those those starting those starting three had enough time to kind of rest those arms. That'll help. If the Nats need to lean on them again, I mean, they're going to do it, I guess, as they get back to the playoffs. But then you look on the offensive side of the ball, you lose Anthony Rendon in free agency um, to the Los Angeles Angels. They give him the payday. He was a guy offensively that really carried him through the regular season and some of the postseason, and especially the World Series he was great in. Um, I mean, you're asking... A guy like Howie Kendrick to do what he did again last year. Of course, the hero in Game 7 hitting that clutch home run. Um, guys like that just don't repeat seasons. I think he's like mid-30s. Um, Ryan Zimmerman has opted out of the season. Mr. National. Um, he's not the player he once was, but definitely a clubhouse asset and a guy that you know is certainly a motivator and all of that. He's opted out for uh, the COVID-19 uh, reasons. So the runs aren't going to be where they were last year. Um, I mean, they they made do last uh, last year after the loss of Bryce Harper. They found a way, but I mean, next man up, I guess they lost Bryce Harper two years ago. Uh, they're losing Anthony Rendon, who's the next man up. Uh, it won't be Ryan Zimmerman. Um, so World Series hangover for sure. Um, the rotation, the starting rotation is the strength. The bullpen should be okay. Lineup, I'm not sure about. Um, but I think just I think even World Series hangover aside, I think they'll be good enough, especially after the news about Marcus Stroman to finish over the Mets and be second in the National League East. Thirty three wins is another tough number. There's a reason these people that set lines for Vegas sports books do what they do because they're very good at it. Um, thirty three. I mean, that's three games over five hundred. 
Um, that is that is tough because I, I mean it's right there, 32, 33, 34 wins. It's right where I would expect them to be. If I would have to choose, which obviously I am, um, for all these, um, man, that is uh, that's tough. Give me, I'm just gonna go over. Definitely, I mean, if I predict them to be second place, they're gonna have to outlast uh, the Mets and the Phillies. So give me the over on the Nats, and then first place, uh, the reigning two-time champion uh, the past years out, the Atlanta Braves. Um, their over unders at 33 and a half wins. Uh, I'll just tell you right now, definitely going over on that. I think that is a low over under total. Um, the offense, Freddie Freeman, I believe, is going to be back. I don't know when. He had COVID-19 and had a really rough go of it. It was like 104 and a half fever. I mean, he he came out and said he, stories like, you know, he was fearing for his life, praying for his life. Um, I think it's interesting that, <laughs> that he wants to come back. Um, after talking with his teammate, Nick Markakis, he has decided um, to opt out of the season. So they lose a guy in that regard. They try to bring a, a Yostiel Puig to replace him in the outfield, but he tested positive for COVID-19 before signing the contract. Um, so he's no longer going to be with the team. So they are missing a guy in the outfield, but you still have Ronald Acuna Jr., who in a regular season would have been a 20-20, maybe even a 30-30 player. I'm not sure he's 40-40 yet if he's that kind of power hitter, but great uh, base dealer, um, really fast. I mean, he's been more with the home runs, but if he can get that contact going, really just probably one of the best uh, leadoff hitters in MLB. But they do have another guy in Dan B. Swanson, a speedy shortstop who's good in that regard, also good with the contact and good on the base path and things like that. So... And then you add in a guy like Ozzy Albies. I like their lineup. I think not having Nick Marquez hurts a little bit, but they they know how to win this division. Uh, these teams are all going to beat each other up. This is one of the most intriguing divisions in all of baseball uh, this season, the National League East. Uh, but give me the Braves to win it, and give me the over on the thirty three and a half. I think they'll get high thirties in win total. I'll say because that's I mean that's not too bad. Seven eight games over five hundred. I think is reasonable uh, for a team like that. So as we approach 11 o'clock, we've talked American League East, National League East. We've got uh, four divisions left to talk about before we go off the air. We were just going to go two hours, but we are going to actually keep powering on as we go into uh, the 12 o'clock hour. Remember, you can call the show at 352-639-0036. Uh, tweet at us at WHBC Stream, And, of course, you can leave us a message in the Spreaker chat where you are listening to this. Don't go anywhere. We will be back in just a couple of minutes. Hey, sports fans. William's currently in the can, but he'll be right back. We're currently on a commercial break, so don't touch that dial. Remember, you can call us at 352 639 0036. Or drop us a line on Twitter at WHBC Stream to tell us what's on your mind. We want to talk sports. We want to get unruly. We want you to tell us what you think so we can argue. Anyway, when all that's said and done, please stay tuned for Williams World Famous Around the XFL podcast and other projects that he's currently got in the works. Please visit WHBCStream.com. And thanks again for listening in.
HBC. And at 11.01, we come back on the William Haynes Show. Scheduled to just go until 11, but ran a little long on some stuff. And to finish up our MLB previews, we are going to power through into the 11 o'clock hour. We appreciate everyone who's been listening to the show. And if you are still listening, wanted to remind you that you can call the show at 352-639-0036 to share any and all sports thoughts. I can mainly MLB tonight. You can tweet us at WHBC Stream and leave us a message in the Spreaker chat. Watching Matt Matt Andrees pitch um, for the Angels in an exhibition game, which is a little weird. Former Rays pitcher, last Rays pitcher, actually to throw a complete game. So shout out certainly to him. As we continue, though, our MLB previews, we talked American League East, we'll talk National League East. Um, just giving a real quick rundown on in the American League East, one through five, got Yankees, Rays, Blue Jays, Red Sox, and Orioles at the bottom. National League East, I have Braves winning. Uh, the Nationals coming in second. Mets close third. Phillies another close fourth. And Marlins at the bottom in fifth place. And then we'll jump back uh, to the American League and go a little bit further west to the American League Central. Now this is an exciting division for sure. Uh, uh, two teams at the bottom, the Tigers and Royals, but the other three are a combination of win now, uh, finishing a rebuild, and a window closing. But all three teams certainly in a win now window. We will start with the team that I anticipate, and I think a lot of people do anticipate to win the American League Central in this 2020 season. That is the Minnesota Twins. Uh, their over under win total is 34, which I mean, maybe the Vegas knows something I don't that they have every division winner like four or five games above 500. I mean, if that's all it's going to take, I mean, then the Rays, you know, could be in this thing, certainly for a wild card, no doubt, uh, with the way their roster is built. But, I mean, the Twins at 34 wins, that seems a little bit low to me. I understand that the, the pitching is not great, the bullpen is not great, but that lineup got even better. They added a guy like Josh Donaldson. They gave him a big contract, like $96 million dollars, I mean, he's in his mid thirties, but he can clobber the baseball. They add in a home. They add him to a lineup that hit the most home runs of any team ever. So I think if they can continue that, I mean, they, it was good enough to win them the American League Central last year. That's all I'll say on that. They did add Kenta Maeda to the starting rotation as part of that Mookie Betts deal. Uh, the pitching, I guess, kind of was their undoing in the postseason, but they kind of just caught the Yankees, and they they never beat the Yankees in the playoffs. So hard to get a read on that. I mean, that was going into that season. That was their weakness. And I think it is again this year. Uh, The lineup is good. And I mean, I don't know how you can count out that lineup uh, to not win the division. I'm going over on the 34. I mean, give me mid, uh, like 35, 36, maybe even 37 wins for the Twins. Um, One thing I'll say as well, teams like uh, the Twins and teams like the Phillies, who don't have a great pitching staff, but a great lineup. Uh, expect them to do better than you would in a normal season because some of these teams, like the Phillies, pitch really well at the, at the first, and when I mean they can put a strain on that pitching staff. Um, I mean, you get into October, your team is in midseason form, so I think if the lineup is going to be able to carry some of these teams, and I think that'll uh, count for an. A, An American League West team that has the best player in baseball. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But give me the Twins to win the American League Central and go over on 34 wins. And second place, this is, I guess, a bit of a controversial statement. Um, The way people have been talking about this team. They were a team that barely missed the playoffs last year. Barely got edged out by the Rays for that second wild card spot. And that would be the Cleveland Indians. The reason I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt over the Chicago White Sox, who to many have been the clear two and maybe even the division winner. Uh, the reason I like the Indians, Terry Francona, first off, one of the best managers in the American or in the in all of Major League Baseball, one of the longest tenured, I believe, second behind Bob Melvin, if I'm not mistaken, because uh, I know Bob Melvin, Terry Francona, and Kevin Cash are the longest tenured managers. Um, hard to believe for Kevin Cash; it's only been six years, but. Um, I like their leadership, the roster, uh, the window is closing, no doubt, but the lineup, they have one of the best players in the American league in, uh, Francisco Lindor, Carlos Santana, 
I'm trying to think of, I mean, they've got a ton of bats, and they're switch hitting bats as well. Sluggers, top to bottom. Uh, the bullpen has been decent. I mean, guys like Brad Hand, uh, that's the headliner. I think he was, I want to say he was the uh, all star MVP in the Cleveland last year. Um, the starting rotation is not what it used to be. Mike Clevenger, I guess, is the ace. Corey Kluber is gone. He's he's to the Rangers. Um, I, I don't know why I can't think of his name. Um, the guy that um, man, that's um, he's been outspoken about the. Um, I got it on the tip of my tongue. This is crazy. Um, I'll I'll look at it. He he bitches for the Reds now. I know I'm gonna be like so embarrassed when I think of his name, um, but he's gone as well. Uh, that that certainly that that certainly hurts them. Um, but I think with the lineup and Terry Francona being able to do what he does, I think ultimately that's going to be enough in an American league central. That's not, that's not tough. They're all going to beat up on each other. Trevor Bauer. That's it. Um, he was the guy that I was thinking of. I couldn't think of, um, he, he's onto the red. So that, uh, Cleveland Indian rotation that used to be really good is not, uh, what it used to be. So, I I don't love the rotation. The bullpen is okay. The lineup is still really good. The, this team's window is closing, I think, this year, just like the Chicago Cubs. Um, but I think it's just enough to edge out a White Sox team who is probably like the Blue Jays a year away in their rebuilding efforts. 32 and a half wins. Um, that's tough. Um, because I have them at number two, I have to go over because of where the White Sox are at at 31 and a half. So 32 and a half wins for Indians, give me over, but just barely, like I'm talking 33, 34 wins at best. They're going to be a 500 team uh, or around there this season. And it, a very close third place, give me the Chicago White Sox at 31 and a half wins. That's the over under. Um, rebuilding effort is coming to a close. They've rebuilt the team from top to bottom. They have added guys like Edwin Encarnacion and um, the catcher, uh, I'm trying to think. I think his name is Yasiel Grandal. I want to say from the Brewers, and they ha- they have guys like Luis Robert um, as one of their top prospects. A ton of prospects um, that have come through the minor leagues. Uh, they're they're poised. Everyone loves them this year. They're supposed to be good. the The pitching I don't love. I mean, it's a lot of new names that we're kind of going to learn. That's what happens like with teams like the Rays come up with a bunch of new players. Um, but the rebuilding effort. The people that know prospects, I'm certainly not one of those people. Um, but the people that rank prospects, and we've seen them. They came up last year. They look good. Um, I have them at number three, though. I think we've seen it in the NFL, and I think it translates to the MLB as well. These rebuild efforts, whenever we think, okay, this is the year, they're usually another year away. I'm going that way with the uh, going that way with the Blue Jays. I'm going that way with the White Sox, and we'll talk a little bit later. I'm going that way in the direction of the Padres. So all those teams are a year away, but can still compete in a 60 game season. No doubt that they can catch fire. That's the case with any team. Even the Orioles, if they catch fire can make a playoff berth, but they won't just because the roster is so bad. But the point is any team can be in this thing. 31 and a half wins. I'm going to have to go under on that. I mean, 31, 30, 29 wins is probably where I'd put them a 500 team. It all depends. The season is so short. If they have a hot streak or a cold streak, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna decide those two or three games, whatever way it leans. Um, but give me under on thirty one and a half, and I have them at third place in the American League Central. And I think these last two teams are easy. The Royals, I'm at fourth. Twenty five is the over under on wins. Um, they had a guy in Jorge Soler that um, I believe had the American League crown and home runs and Whit Merrifield the guy who has a stolen base crown I think from a couple years ago not a whole lot of other highlights the pitching staff is not great the bullpen is not great the lineup is not great there's just not a whole lot to love um, about this team I'm not going to say much more about them um, 25 uh, I'm going to take the under on that I think they're going to be low 20s um, in wins and then rounding it out another team that I'm not going to spend too much time talking about is the Detroit Tigers. Um, the Tigers, 
outside of the Orioles, were anticipated to be one of the worst teams this year. They're another team that is full-fledged in a rebuild. They tore the whole thing down. The only remnant from the Tigers of old uh, would be Miguel Cabrera. I think he's going to be fun to watch like he is every year, but not enough to do anything uh, with this team. I think 22 is extremely generous on over-under. Um, well, uh, extremely generous is a bit of a stretch. I'm thinking low 20s and wins, 20 or 21. So give me under on the 22, and I've got them dead last at 5th in the American League Central. So to recap, Twins at 1, Indians edging the White Sox out for 2, a White Sox close 3rd, Royals 4th, and Tigers at the bottom at 5th place. And as we move bottom, or as we move over to the National League and staying in the Central, I, this is a division that was easily the worst division in baseball. Well, that and the National League West were were pretty bad. Um, but top to bottom, teams that struggled, a team can probably be one or two games over 500 and win this thing. I think the one benefit is whoever comes out on top in both divisions in the American and National League Central, uh, it's going to be because they get to beat up on these bad teams. I mean, there's like combined, I mean, there's two, three teams that are really good and they all get to beat up on each other. So like, for example, the Twins, they get to beat up on the Tigers, the Royals, the Pirates, um, the you know, the Brewers to some extent, the Cubs to some extent. I mean, they all get to play each other. Um, so I think a couple teams are going to be good and the rest are probably going to be pretty bad. Um, but in a short season, you know, it'll all be, it'll all look close, I guess, optics wise. But winning the division, I would say this with, with some certainty. If I had to pick a, a division favorite that I like the most um, outside of maybe the National League West, um, I would say this is the most certain. Give me the Cardinals. Really low over under win total. Um, at 31 and a half, they were a team that won the National League Central uh, a year ago. They look good. They added guys, um, and uh, the first baseman, um, P- uh, Paul Goldschmidt, who looked really good. Um, they they've got a, a good lineup. Their pitching staff is a, a mix of young, a mix of old. Jack Flaher- Flaherty, who was the best running pitcher um, of any of any uh, of any team of any staff. In the second half of last year, Jordan Hicks in the bullpen is the guy who has opted out um, for the season due to, I guess, COVID nineteen concerns. But I think he was going to be missing some time uh, with injury as well. Um, I mean, a weak division, a team that knows how to win. Uh, the no fans thing certainly hurts them because they're a team that's at the top of attendance every year. Um, but. I think like the Braves, they know how to win the division. Their roster is built a certain way. Adam Wainwright, another guy in their rotation that's done it for a while. Um, I just I like their ability to kind of win some of these close games and win a tough division. Over under on thirty one and a half. Obviously, they're gonna have to finish above five hundred. So give me the over for the Cardinals. At second place, I have another team that's coming out of a rebuilding effort. I guess you could say I, I would say they're one of those teams that are probably ready for a rebuild, but they're kind of bridging together with veterans. Uh, That's the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, Trevor Bauer, the guy that they brought into the trade deadline last year, they tried to make a push. They brought in Trevor Bauer, Tanner Rourke, um, and some other guys. Um, The lineup should be okay. I'm I'm not going to lie to you. I I don't know a ton about Cincinnati Reds baseball, but um, they're they're supposed to – people are high on them. They've got prospects coming up. I know Aquino – he who was well who did hit well last year i don't think he's even going to be on the opening day roster um so that tells me everything i need to know that they have a roster top to bottom that they like especially with the universal dh a guy like him who was more of a slugger not a great outfielder um if they don't need him then i i think their their roster um is good a, a below average offense probably i like the pitching paul goldschmidt is a nice power hitter to have at the top of the lineup um, I don't love any team, or that was about the Cardinals, excuse me, about the Reds. Um, I don't know. I If I had to give the edge, I would give them the Cardinals uh, over the Reds. But uh, the same over-under win total, 31.5. Um, ultimately, uh, give me the over. I think they'll finish a couple games above 500. So I think the Cardinals and Reds, inter- interchangeable to an extent. I mean, I think even the next team we're going to talk about uh, can make a run at this thing as well. Um 
So give me the over for the Reds. They're finished second place. Um, just another quick reminder, I'm going to keep telling you, you can call the show, 352-639-0036. Message us on Twitter, WHBC Stream, and you can leave a message as well in the Spreaker chat. Uh, finishing out the show, went into a third hour here, uh, talking all things MLB baseball, going over win totals, and then we'll get out of here. Um, and as we finish the National League Central, uh, the pa- the last couple teams um, at third place, and th- this division is really close together. The Cubs, a 32 and a half is the over under win total. So Vegas sees them winning the division. I think a lot of them do have the Cubs predicted, but I think the window is really closing. This is the last chance that they have. Um, Anthony, uh, Brian, or Chris Bryant, um, th- those guys that were on that 2006, 2016 World Series team, I-, I think they're running out of gas. Joe Madden is out of town. Um, they, they bring in that, um, uh, I can't think of his name, but the catcher that, that used to play for them just a couple years ago, um, is the new manager. I'm not in love with it. Um, that's all I'll say. The starting rotation, I don't love. They lose um, a guy like Cole Hamels uh, uh, to the Braves. The bullpen, I don't love either. Um, and National League Central, it could go either way. I've got them third place, just under the Reds, 32 and a half. Uh, give me the under. I would say they're a 500 team, 30, 31, 32 at best on the win. So going under there. And then to finish it out, the Milwaukee Brewers, a team... Uh, who got a win over the White Sox in an inter-squad game tonight. Don't know if that really means anything. Probably not. Um, but they're slated over under 30 and a half wins, a 500 team. I would say I'd agree with that. They were a team that looked pretty good, like they were going to win the division last year. And then, of course, Christian Yelich gets uh, injured for the season. They end up uh, sneaking out the second wild card. And they almost win against the Nationals, which is pretty crazy. Um, against I mean, Max Scherzer was on the mound, and they almost won that game. It was the the error um, on that uh, that uh, Juan Soto hit that was the difference in that game. I don't know what they would have done otherwise. Um, relatively same roster, I believe. Christian Yelich, obviously, he's big to have him back. Um, guys like obviously El Garcia, Eric Sogard, coming over from the Rays. I mean, it's a good lineup. Um, again, I'm not a big National League Central guy. I don't know uh, about the the starting rotation so much in the bullpen. I know it's not a lot of names you would recognize. Uh, per se, but it, it worked for them last year. I think they're another 500 team. I've got a sh- finishing fourth. That's no knock on them. I think that it's going to be so close, especially in a short season. They're not going to have enough games to kind of shorten it out. I would imagine there's going to be some tiebreaker games. Um, I mean, the fact that there's 162 games in seasons and teams still tie, I mean, 60 games, there's going to be tiebreaker games, and that'll be fun, uh, no doubt. Uh, the Brewers playing in a tiebreaker game actually a couple years ago uh, against the Cubs. So give me the Brewers at fourth in the National League Central. Over under on 30 and a half. Um, that's tough. Give me over. I like them at 31 wins. And to round it out, I think this is an easy pick. The Pirates at dead last. 25 and a half. Uh, that's generous. Give me the under. I'm just going to say outright on that. Give me the under for the 25. Uh, and to have wins. Bare Bones roster, another team, complete teardown, uh, starting from scratch. They traded Starling Marte in the offseason uh, to the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, I just, th- th- I th- there's nothing on that roster really to like. Uh, I think an easy pick to finish last. Um, and so, quickly to recap, I don't feel super confident about these picks. I would stay away. If you're going to bet money, I would stay away from the National League Central without a doubt. Uh, but finishing first, I have the Cardinals. Behind them, the rebuilding Reds at two, maybe about a year away. We'll see. Cubs at three, Brewers at four, and Pirates dead last at fifth. And now we'll move over to the American League and back or over west, all the way out west for the American League West. This is another tough division. I struggled. I went back and forth. Uh, We'll start at the top first. I like the Astros to win it. Um, 35 is the over under so five games about over 500 i think which is about right i think that's a good um line to set at um there's a couple ways you could look at this astros team um you could look at them as they're going to send a message their revenge tour 
you know, all, you know, no one believes in them. They want to prove the, everyone wrong. That's fine. They lost Garrett Cole, but they still have a good rotation. Of course, Justin Verlander, who's, I mean, he's going to get worse eventually. I mean, he just won a Cy Young, but he's in his late 30s. You'd expect him to break down at some point. Um, you have still Zach Grinke. You have Lance McCullers Jr. coming back, who looked good in his uh, exhibition game. He's back from Tommy John surgery. Um, and then, how, however, they're going to match up the back of that rotation. The bullpen, as we saw, uh, is okay. They can lock up games. Roberto Asuna. Uh, they've got some other guys that can get outs where they need it. The lineup is really good, no doubt. Um, I don't want to come off seeming kind of because that is the easy thing to talk about. The lineup is oh they're good, but what about the trash cans? They're not going to be there. They're not stealing the signs anymore. I can't tell you how that's going to come into play. Um, I know that they're major league hitters, and I know and I know that they're good at it. Jose Altuve, Alex Bregman. Um, Michael Brantley, George Springer, like these guys or not, like the uniform, like the team or not, they're good hitters. Um, and I think how much I disliked them, I wanted to put them second, and that told me the bias uh, that I had. And they're, they're they're the best team in the American League West. Um, I wanted to go with the Athletics, but that's a discussion that's been had for the past couple of years. Can the Athletics win the division? And they can't. It's always been the Astros that have been taking the title. And even a season like this where they're going to be getting their best from every other team, I don't think that means that much. In a 60-game season, if a baseball team is not giving their best, they're doing it wrong. Um, So I don't think that really comes into play. It would have in a 162-game season. On a getaway day on a Wednesday afternoon against the Seattle Mariners, the Mariners are going to be giving you their best baseball. They're not a great team, but they're going to be playing you much harder than they would be playing the Tigers, per se. Um, if they're out of the playoff race, just because you want to beat that team because they disgraced the sport and they really should have been punished more than they were. And players are going to be dealing their own justice. There's going to be a lot of that stuff um, going on. They didn't get away from this just because the season took a couple months off. Um, <clears throat> but I like them to win the division. 35 and a half. That's tough. Give me the over. I like them at about 36, 37 wins. So depending on where you can get that line, I would take it um, depending on how you feel. About him, so give me over on 35 and win the division. At number two, the Oakland Athletics, a team that has been a contender. They've you know made the playoffs the past couple years, both wild card, um, both years. <clears throat> um, they always get it done. You know, you've seen the movie Moneyball. You know what Billy Bean and company can do. They find value from nothing. Um, I love their lineup. Matt Chapman is one of the best players in the American League defensively, but can hit a lot of home runs too. Matt Olson over there at first base. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of Marcus Simeon. He played all 162 games at shortstop last year. Um, their outfield is good. <clears throat> we, you, I mean, you saw the wild card game. If the Rays had not hit the home runs that they would have, they would have been in some trouble. Uh, no doubt, it's a good Athletics team. Um, they kind of just unraveled at home. I don't know exactly what happened in that game, but a good team, a playoff team, no doubt. I don't know. The way this season is going to shake out, if they will make the playoffs, um, I don't, I don't know about a wild card. I, if they can't win this division, I don't think they're going to win enough games to get in the dance. But <clears throat> I like the way they're built. Didn't really lose anyone from last year. You still got Matt Chapman, Marcus Simeon, Matt Olson. I mean, that's a star-studded infield right there. And the pitching, they get outs where they need. They lost Blake Trinan to the Dodgers out of the bullpen, uh, but they still have guys that can get outs. Um, the starting pitching, I don't love, but that's always kind of been their weakness, and they get through it. Um, the Athletics, a team like that, if you, even if you don't love the, the roster, you give them the benefit of the doubt because they've been there and they've done that. I just don't like them enough uh, to have them win the division. So I have them at second place. 32 and a half wins. Give me over. I like them at about 34 or 30. Yeah, 33 or 34 wins, but right below the Astros um, at 35. And third place, <clears throat> I have the Los Angeles Angels. I think they're a team that could potentially replace the Ast- or replace the Athletics for second place. A team that I think is finally ready to make the push. They've kind of... It's obviously not a rebuild. They're just kind of like the Reds. 
they're like right there on the precipice of like maybe thinking wild card and they just add free agents. Um, the the L, the LA Angels they they add Joe Madden as a manager that certainly helps a lot. You saw what he did for the Cubs, what he did for the Rays. It's undoubted he adds. Um, uh, I guess um, you can't put a number on how many wins he's gonna add. I mean he just so much better than what they've had. I would say Mike Trout is still the best player in baseball. Um, getting the last couple years, um, out of a guy like Albert Pujols. Um, adding Anthony Rendon certainly helps. He was one of the best players in the league last year. Um, was a dark horse candidate for um, the NL MVP. The, the Angels pay the big bucks just like they did for Pujols um, to get him over there uh, down to Anaheim. Um, so that top of the lineup is good. Um, they have not had a great hitter behind Trout, and they finally do um, in um, Rendon. I think that's going to help. I don't love the pitching staff. That's always kind of been their weakness. Starting rotation is weak. Bullpen is weak. Uh, kind of like the Phillies is what I would equate him to, but a little bit different. I like the Phillies lineup top to bottom a lot better, but you can't beat that one-two punch at the top of the lineup. I mean, talk about a team putting up runs in the first inning every game. Whoever you put at lead off, um, I don't know how to say his name. The, the His last name is Simmons. I'll, I'm not even going to try uh, Simmons, the shortstop, speedy contact, put him at leadoff. Put Rendon at two, uh, Trout at three, and Pujols at four. Or maybe, I don't know about Pujols at four, but you get my drift. Those, I mean, I don't know how they don't score in the first inning every game. And that lineup, if they can get enough hits out of the bottom and you know flip the lineup back to the top and you got Trout and Rendon and Pujols and Simmons, I mean... Uh, and Joe Madden piecing some stuff creatively together at the bullpen. I like him. 31 on the over front on the wins is perfect. Um, I think it's going to be neck and neck. Actually, give me the under on that. I like him to finish uh, at or below 500. I know I just made a case for him, but I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's tough. If you take Mike Trout off this team, no question – not a great team um but it's this isn't this isn't the nba one player cannot take you to the promised land as good as mike trout can be we've seen superhuman efforts from him before and it's just not been enough and i think um you have to take that in consideration i I mean he'll you know wins above replacement he's probably going to be the lifetime leader in that regard he 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 gives a lot he adds a lot of wins to a team but it's just not going to be enough so give me the under on 31 for the Angels. And as we finish out the bottom, the Rangers, a team over under at 28 and a half wins. I like the rotation. They added Cor- Co- um, Kluber, Corey Kluber, and they have guys like Mike Miner and Lance Lynn um, and some other guys that pitch well um, as starters last year. The bullpen, I think, is okay, but not great. Definitely better rotation. And the bats are good. They have guys like Joey Gallo and... Um, Johnson Blanks on some names, but a, a good order as well. Um, I don't think, certainly, I don't know what happened to him. I think they were a, a, like a contender. People were high on him, and then the season went off, and all of a sudden, not as much. I think them and the Angels are going to finish probably identical in win total. I'd be interested to see those Angels-Rangers series, because I, I think, not that they're built similarly, but I think they're neck-and-neck neck, talent-wise, at least on paper, um, definitely give the Rangers nod in pitching, not to the Angels in hitting. Uh, 28 and a half, the win total. Um, that's tough, but I'm going to go under. Like a maybe 26, 27 wins. Maybe a little lower. So just a handful of games under 500. Um, and then to finish it out, easy pick. Seattle Mariners to finish dead last. 23 and a half wins. Uh, give me just under. That's tough. Um, yeah, like. 20 21 wins i would expect them to be at it's just rebuilding effort they got that um center fielder that they got in the um from the mets and that edwin diaz and uh cano trade i don't know if he'll play this year but that'll be if you're a manners fan that'll be cool to see because he's supposed to be one of the better prospects in baseball that's about the only bright side uh that i see from them this year so give me the under and have him finished dead last so to round it out 
Astros at one, Athletics finishing second, Angels behind at three, Rangers close fourth, and Mariners dead last at fifth. And now, uh, last but not least, um, the NL West. We'll see a matchup of that uh, tomorrow night, Dodgers and Giants. Um, definitely got. I don't have money on the Dodgers, but I would if if I could find it, find a line somewhere. I think it's like um, Giants plus three hundred, but I I don't know how the um, the Dodgers lose that game with Kershaw on the mound. Um, but anyway, starting at the top um, with the Dodgers, I got them first place. Obviously, that's a lock. Um, any team I'm looking across the board. If I had to bet on a team to win the division, Dodgers are obviously the most the most clear pick. Thirty eight is the over under on wins, so at least in this book that I found, uh, over under win totals, they are the favorites in the league, just a half game better, I guess, than the Yankees. But I like the Yankees roster better. Um, probably the reason the line is higher because the Dodgers schedule is much easier. The Yankees, although they're better, they face a tougher schedule. But of course, if they win the World Series, you would have the Yankees. Um, in that, but the, the the Dodgers would, if you had to bet, like favorite for most wins of any team, probably the Dodgers because of the weekend schedule that they play. Um, clear number one. Don't have to talk much about it. Great lineup, top to bottom. You know, Mookie Betts. Um, trying to think, they've they've got all kinds of guys. Alex. Um, I don't know. Why I can't think of his name, but a great lineup, top to bottom. Great pitching staff. Clinton Kershaw. Uh, Walker Bueller was a Cy Young candidate. Um, you've got, um, try to think of his name. They've, um, I don't know why I'm blanking on all these guys, but they've got some prospect starting pitchers that are really good. And some guys, um, that can pitch well, like three, uh, four and five starters. Uh, the bullpen is good. Kenley Jansen is good closer, a really complete team, easy number one pick. I'll go over on the 38. Um, well, yeah, I'll get I'll go over just because the schedule is so easy. Uh, number two, I think the Diamondbacks and Padres are neck and neck, but I'll give the edge to the Diamondbacks because they're a little more experienced. Of course, the headline they add um, Madison Bumgarner in the off season. I think that helps a lot. Starting a rotation that was not great uh, last season. Mike Leak, a guy that they picked up, I believe, in the trade deadline from Seattle, he opted out. So that definitely hurts them. Uh, but I like their lineup as well. Kittel uh, Marte uh, was one of the best players, uh, one of the most underrated players in baseball, no doubt. Second baseman, center fielder. He's going to be able to move back to second base now. They picked up Starling Marte, a silver slugger award winner from the Pirates. Um, I like their lineup. I like what they can do with the starting pitching. Bumgarner, having an ace like that certainly helps a staff. Um the bullpen, I think, should be okay. The schedule is relatively easy. Uh, the West catches a break in that regard. Um, at 31 over under wins, give me um, on give me over. I think 31 is a good total for him, but just for the sake, I mean, 32, 33 wins is not hard to get. A couple games over 500 is not too crazy. And at third place, a very close third, the Padres. They're over or under win total. I'm watching them right now play the Angels um, on the monitor. But the Padres, another team, we talk about them all the time. They got the prospects. They've added free agents, Manny Machado uh, specifically. They, they brought Tommy Pham over. Um, they've got stars, no doubt. They've got prospects galore. Probably, I mean... I don't. I'm not familiar with all the guys, but the experts say that the this, the Padres may have the best bullpen of all 30 teams. That certainly helps if you can get a if you can get a couple runs on the board. I mean, I love their lineup. Manny Machado, um, Fernando Tatis Jr. is great. I believe they got some. I mean, Tommy Pham was a guy that I mentioned. Um, they've got prospects, obviously that I'm not familiar with, but the, the experts, the people that know, say that they they've got great prospects. Chris Paddock. Is a great starting pitcher. Well, he's not great yet, but I mean, he he looks like that's where he's trending. A, a prospect that got kind of started in the 2019 season. People were expecting them to be good last year. They were probably two years away then, so one year away now. Um, but in a 60 game season, like the Toronto, I think they're better than the Blue Jays, but kind of in that situation where maybe a year away, but in a short season, uh, can kind of cover up some of those holes that they have. So 
I don't know how good the rotation is going to be. I like Paddock, and I think there's a, a couple, one or two other prospects that are supposed to be good starting pitching. Uh, the bullpen is great. All indication, lineup is good. I'm really talking myself into the Padres right now, um, but I'm going to stick with my prediction on paper, um, having the Diamondbacks ahead of them. But um, actually, I do like the over on the 30 and a half. I've talked myself into them. So give me the over on that. And then the final two teams, the Rockies. Uh, at four, 27 and a half wins, I would be inclined to go under. I mean, that's just two or three games um, under 500. I do not think they're that good. Um, they've got Nolan Arenado, obviously one of the better players in the National League. They just signed at the big deal and they tried to trade him. Um, pitching is not great. Obviously, in that park, they're not going to try and build pitching because there's no point. You know, it's easy to carry the baseball uh, with home runs. They build it off of offense. Um but I don't love the offense. I don't love the pitching. Um, but they're better than the Giants. But I would go under still on the 27.5. And, and the Giants, this is really easy. This line cannot still be 25 um, after the Buster Posey and all that stuff uh, opted out. Um, Giants, I think, are one of the worst teams. They lose Madison Bumgarner. Uh, they lose Buster Posey for the year. Uh, he opted out because of those premature uh, Twins that he's about to adopt certainly can't blame him in that regard. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what you point to and like. I mean, I think the bullpen is okay. You got guys like Jeff Samarja. I think they have a couple other like decent middle of the road starters, but a weak lineup certainly. Um, they've got prospects like the catcher that's going to play in place of Buster Posey is a top prospect. Um, they're creative. The front office is supposed to be kind of like the Rays, and that you know they study the saber metrics and things like that. Obviously, have not been able to pull it off. Um, they were a middle of the pack team uh, last season before, I guess, kind of committing to tear it down. I mean, not signing, not re-signing Madison Bumgarner, a guy who carried you to a couple World Series titles, and when Buster Posey finally calls it a career, or maybe they move him. Um, certainly they tried to win now at the deadline last year. They went all in because they were thinking about trading Madison Bumgarner and they didn't, they probably should have in hindsight because they didn't resign them and they didn't make the playoffs. But, um, that shows you where their head's at now that they're going to rebuild. Um, we'll see them tomorrow. I think they're going to get clobbered by the Dodgers. I believe that's in Dodger stadium or it certainly should be. That would be kind of dumb if they had that in, uh, the giant stadium. But, um, I'm going to go under on the 25. I think that's really an easy one. Um, <clears throat> so give me the under on the Giants. like them to finish fifth. So to finish out the NL West, I'd like the Dodgers to win it. Diamondbacks, two. Padres, a very close three. Rockies, four. And Giants, five. I'll give you another chance as I wrap up the show to call us at 352-639-0036. Or you can drop us a line at WHBC Stream or leave us a message uh, in the speaker chat talking all things sports on the eve uh just 20 minutes away from the official mlb opening day um as we move to the end of the show um just a a few things to wrap i guess i think the yankees are clearly the best team talking if i had to make playoff predictions i'll go across the board here so to win the division in in the american league i like astros to win the west twins to win the central yankees to win the east and then wild card as I'm taking a look here quickly, give me Rays to win the first wild card. And that's tough. Um, mm, I'm thinking either White Sox or Athletics. Give me the Athletics. So a rematch of last year's wild card game, but in St. Petersburg this time. So I'll give the second wild card to the A's. And then in the National League, I have the Braves to win the East. Cardinals to win the Central, and Dodgers to win the West. Um, Dodgers will be the clear one seed, obviously. Braves probably two. Cardinals three. I'm not. I don't feel confident in the Cardinals, but if I had to pick a team out of the Central, I would give it to them. Um, and then talking wild cards. Um, man, I would say. I would. I might be inclined to give both to the NL East, to be honest. Uh, Because I like the Nationals and I like the Mets. I also really like the Phillies too. That's tough. The Reds, I think, are going to be in the mix. If they make the playoffs, probably just 
I mean, I don't see how the winner of the NL Central is going to be more than three games under over 500. Um, so I'll give I'll, I'll give both wild cards um, to the to the East. I'll give the first one to the Nats, so they'll have the wild card game in Nationals Park for the second straight year, and then Mets finally getting off the schneid and into the postseason. Um, and then predicting playoffs, um, American League pennant. I hate to say it, but I got to give it to the Yankees. I think the the Rays are good, but the Yankees, I mean, their their payroll is like three times bigger than ours. Um, the Rays definitely get more value, price per win, but at the end of the day, when you're holding that World Series t- uh, trophy, it doesn't matter how much you paid for it. It matters that it's going back to your city. Um, so the Yankees and I lo- uh, Dodgers are a lock out of the National League. They should have been last year, and they choked it away in Game 5. Um, but I think they caught a Nats team that was just on fire. No one was going to bring them down. Not even the Astros banging on the trash cans could stop that team. Um, so like the Dodgers, so Dodgers, Yankees, classic world series. I think you got to go Yankees to win it. Um, so I'll make a note of that and I'll keep this. We'll probably go over this maybe mid season. There's no all-star game, obviously. Um, but we'll, we'll reference this, um, a few times as we move along as we'll go ahead and wrap the show up and we almost made it to three hours my my platform that i stream off of speaker literally only allows me to go three hours so i had about 17 minutes to wrap the show up i was only planning on going two hours but had a lot to talk about getting caught up on the news mookie bets big extension so excited for baseball give you my quick predictions uh give me yankees over nationals and then in the second game dodgers giants and um actually we'll take the night off tomorrow i want to just take in the game um that gets started at 10 eastern for the dodgers giants game so we'll come at you on friday 9 p.m after the rays game so hopefully they'll win and we will talk to you then HBC.